Chapter Twenty Five of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Shirley Goes. No, Woodrow, there will be no peace without victory, said Susan, sticking her knitting needle viciously through President Wilson's name in the newspaper column. We Canadians mean to have peace and victory too. You, if it pleases you, Woodrow, can have the peace without the victory. And Susan stalked off to bed with the comfortable consciousness of having got the better of the argument with the President. But a few days later she rushed to Mrs. Blythe in red-hot excitement. Mrs. Dr. dear, what do you think? A phone message has just come through from Charlottetown that Woodrow Wilson has sent the German ambassador man to the right about at last. They tell me that means war. So I begin to think that Woodrow's heart is in the right place after all wherever his head may be, and I am going to commandeer a little sugar and celebrate the occasion with some fudge, despite the howls of the food board. I thought that submarine business would bring things to a crisis. I told Cousin Sophia so when she said it was the beginning of the end for the Allies. Don't let the doctor hear of the fudge, Susan, said Anne with a smile. You know he has laid down very strict rules for us along the lines of economy the government has asked for. Yes, Mrs. Dr. dear, and a man should be master in his own household, and his women folk should bow to his decrees. I flatter myself that I am becoming quite efficient in economizing. Susan had taken to using certain German terms with killing effect. But one can exercise a little gumption on the quiet now and then. Shirley was wishing for some of my fudge the other day, the Susan brand, as he called it, and I said, the first victory there is to celebrate, I shall make you some. I consider this news quite equal to a victory, and what the doctor does not know will never grieve him. I take the whole responsibility, Mrs. Dr. dear, so do not you vex your conscience. Susan spoiled Shirley shamelessly that winter. He came home from Queen's every weekend, and Susan had all his favorite dishes for him, in so far as she could evade or wheedle the doctor, and waited on him hand and foot. Though she talked more constantly to everyone else, she never mentioned it to him or before him, but she watched him like a cat watching a mouse, and when the German retreat from the Balpom Salient began and continued, Susan's exultation was linked up with something deeper than anything she expressed. Surely the end was in sight, would come now before anyone else could go. Things are coming our way at last, we have got the Germans on the run, she boasted. The United States has declared war at last, as I always believed they would, in spite of Woodrow's gift for letter-writing and you will see that they will go into it with a vim since i understand that is their habit when they do start and we have got the germans on the run too the states mean well moaned cousin sophia but all the women in the world cannot put them on the fighting line this spring and the allies will be finished before that the germans are just during them on that man simmons says their retreat has put the allies in a hole that man simons has said more than he will ever live to make good retorted susan I do not worry myself about his opinion, as long as Lloyd George is the Premier of England. He will not be bamboozled, and that you may tie to. Things look good to me. The U.S. is in the war, and we have got Kut and Baghdad back. And I would not be surprised to see the Allies in Berlin by June, and the Russians too, since they have got rid of the Tsar. That, in my opinion, was a good piece of work. Time will show if it is, said Cousin Sophia who would have been very indignant if any one had told her that she would rather see Susan put to shame as a seer than a successful overthrow of tyranny, or even the march of the Allies down Unter den Linden. But then the woes of the Russian people were quite unknown to Cousin Sophia, while this aggravating, optimistic Susan was an ever-present thorn in her side. Just at that moment Shirley was sitting on the edge of the table in the living room, swinging his legs, a brown, ruddy, wholesome lad, from top to toe, every inch of him, and saying coolly, Mother and Dad, I was eighteen last Monday. Don't you think it's about time I joined up? The pale mother looked at him. Two of my sons have gone, and one will never return. Must I give you two, Shirley? The age-old cry. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. How the mothers of the Great War echoed the old patriarch's moan of so many centuries agone. You wouldn't have me a slacker, Mother. I can get into the flying court. What say, Dad? The doctor's hands were not quite steady as he folded up the powders he was concocting for Abby Flagg's rheumatism. He had known this moment was coming, yet he was not altogether prepared for it. He answered slowly, I won't try to hold you back from what you believe to be your duty, but you must not go unless your mother says you may. Shirley said nothing more. 
He was not a lad of many words. Anne did not say anything more just then, either. She was thinking of little Joyce's grave in the old burying ground over harbor. Little Joyce, who would have been a woman now had she lived, of the white cross in France, and the splendid gray eyes of the little boy who had been taught his first lessons of duty and loyalty at her knee, of Jem in the terrible trenches, of Nan and Di and Rilla, waiting, 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 while the golden years of youth passed by, and she wondered if she could bear any more. She thought not. Surely she had given enough. Yet that night she told Shirley he might go. They did not tell Susan right away. She did not know it until a few days later. Shirley presented himself in her kitchen in his aviation uniform. Susan didn't make half the fuss she had made when Jem and Walter had gone. She said stonily, So, they're going to take you, too. Take me? No. I'm going, Susan. Got to. Susan sat down by the table, folded her knotted old hands that had grown warped and twisted, working for the Ingleside children, to still their shaking, and said, Yes, you must go. I did not see once why such things must be, but I can see now. You're a brick, Susan, said Shirley. He was relieved that she took it so coolly. He had been a little afraid, with the boy's horror of a scene. He went out whistling gaily, but half an hour later, when pale Anne Blythe came in, Susan was still sitting there. Mrs. Doctor, dear, said Susan, making an admission she would once have died rather than make. I feel very old. Jim and Walter were yours, but Shirley is mine, and I cannot bear to think of him flying, his machine crashing down, the life crushed out of his body, the dear little body I nursed and cuddled when he was a wee baby. Susan, don't, cried Anne. Oh, Mrs. Doctor, dear, I beg your pardon. I ought not to have said anything like that out loud. I sometimes forget that I resolved to be a heroine. This, this has shaken me a little, but I will not forget myself again. Only, if things do not go as smoothly in the kitchen for a few days, I hope you will make due allowance for me. At least, said poor Susan, forcing a grim smile in a desperate effort to recover lost standing, at least flying is a clean job. He will not get so dirty and messed up as he would in the trenches, and that is well for he has always been a tidy child. So Shirley went, not radiantly as to a high adventure like Jem, not in a white flame of sacrifice like Walter, but in a cool, business-like mood, as of one doing something, rather dirty and disagreeable, that had just got to be done. He kissed Susan for the first time since he was five years old and said, Goodbye, Susan, Mother Susan. My little brown boy, my little brown boy, said Susan. I wonder, she thought bitterly, as she looked at the doctor's sorrowful face, if you remember how you spanked him once when he was a baby. I am thankful I have nothing like that on my conscience now. The doctor did not remember the old discipline, but before he put on his hat to go out on his round of calls, he stood for a moment in the great silent living room that had once been full of children's laughter. Our last son, our last son, he said aloud. A good, sturdy, sensible lad, too. Always reminded me of my father. I suppose I ought to be proud that he wanted to go. I was proud when Jem went, even when Walter went. But our house is left us desolate. I have been thinking, Doctor, Old Sandy of the Upper Glen said to him that afternoon, that your house will be seeming very big the day. Highland Sandy's quaint phrase struck the doctor as perfectly expressive. Ingleside did seem very big and empty that night, yet Shirley had been away all winter except for weekends, and had always been a quiet fellow even when home. Was it because he had been the only one left that his going seemed to leave such a huge blank, that every room seemed vacant and deserted? that the very trees on the lawn seemed to be trying to comfort each other with caresses of fresh budding boughs for the loss of the last of the little lads who had romped under them in childhood. Susan worked very hard all day and late into the night. When she had wound the kitchen clock and put Dr. Jekyll out, none too gently, she stood for a little while on the doorstep, looking down the glen, which lay tranced in faint silvery light from a sinking young moon. But Susan did not see the familiar hills and harbor. She was looking at the aviation camp in Kingsport, where Shirley was that night. He called me Mother Susan, she was thinking. Well, all our menfolk have gone now. 
Jem and Walter and Shirley and Jerry and Carl, and none of them had to be driven to it, so we have a right to be proud. But pride... Susan sighed bitterly. Ah, <sighs> pride is cold company, and that there is no gainsaying. The moon sank lower into a black cloud in the west. The glen went out in an eclipse of sudden shadow, and thousands of miles away the Canadian boys in khaki, the living and the dead, were in possession of Vimy Ridge. Vimy Ridge is a name written in crimson and gold on the Canadian annals of the Great War. The British couldn't take it, and the French couldn't take it, said a German prisoner to his captors. But you, Canadians, are such fools that you don't know when a place can't be taken. So the fools took it and paid the price. Jerry Meredith was seriously wounded at Vimy Ridge. Shot in the back, the telegram said. Poor Nan, said Mrs. Blythe when the news came. She thought of her own happy girlhood at Green Gables. There had been no tragedy like this in it. How the girls of today had to suffer. When Nan came home from Redmond two weeks later, her face showed what those weeks had meant to her. John Meredith, too, seemed to have grown old suddenly in them. Faith did not come home. She was on her way across the Atlantic as a V.A.D. Di had tried to wring from her father consent to her going also, but had been told that for her mother's sake it could not be given. So Di, after a flying visit home, went back to a Red Cross work at Kingsport. The Mayflowers bloomed in the secret nooks of Rainbow Valley. Rilla was watching for them. Jem had once taken his mother the earliest Mayflowers. Walter brought them to her when Jem was gone. Last spring, Shirley had shot them out for her. Now, Rilla thought she must take the boy's place in this. But before she had discovered any, Bruce Meredith came to Ingleside one twilight, with his hands full of delicate pink sprays. He stalked up the steps of the veranda and laid them on Mrs. Blythe's lap. "'Because Shirley isn't here to bring them,' he said in his funny, shy, blunt way. "'And you thought of this, you darling.' said Anne, her lips quivering, as she looked at the stocky, black-browed little chap, standing before her, with his hands thrust into his pockets. "'I wrote Jem today, and told him not to worry about you not getting your Mayflowers,' said Bruce seriously. "'Cause I'd see to that. And I told him I would be ten pretty soon now, so it won't be very long before I'll be eighteen. And then I'll go to help him fight, and maybe let him come home for a rest while I took his place. I wrote Jerry, too.' "'Jerry's getting better, you know.' "'Is he? Have you had any good news about him?' "'Yes. Mother had a letter today, and it said he was out of danger.' "'Oh, thank God,' murmured Mrs. Blythe in a half-whisper. Bruce looked at her curiously. "'That is what Father said when Mother told him. But when I said it the other day when I found out Mr. Mead's dog hadn't hurt my kitten, I thought he had chicken it to death, you know. Father looked awful solemn and said I must never say that again about a kitten. But I couldn't understand why, Mrs. Blythe. I felt awful thankful, and it must have been God that saved Stripey, because that me dog had enormous jaws, and oh, how it shook poor Stripey. And so why couldn't I thank him? Course, added Bruce reminiscently. Maybe I said it too loud, because I was awful glad and excited when I found Stripey was all right, I most shouted it, Mrs. Blythe. Maybe if I'd said it sort of whispery, like you and father, it would have been all right. Do you know, Mrs. Blythe? Bruce dropped to a whispery tone, edging a little nearer to Anne. What I would like to do to the Kaiser, if I could. What would you like to do, laddie? Norman Rees said in school today that he would like to tie the Kaiser to a tree and set cross dogs to worrying him, said Bruce gravely. And Emily Flagg said she would like to put him in a cage and poke sharp things into him. And they all said things like that. But, Mrs. Blythe... Bruce took a little square paw out of his pocket and put it earnestly on Anne's knee. I would like to turn the Kaiser into a good man. A very good man. All at once if I could. That is what I would do. Don't you think, Mrs. Blythe, that would be the very worstest punishment of all? Bless the child, said Susan. How do you make out that would be any kind of punishment for that wicked fiend? Don't you see? said Bruce, looking levelly at Susan, out of his blackly blue eyes. If he was turned into a good man, he would understand how dreadful the things he has done are, 
and he would feel so terrible about it that he would be more unhappy and miserable than he could ever be in any other way. He would feel just awful, and he would go on feeling like that forever. Yes. Bruce clenched his hands and nodded his head emphatically. Yes, I would make the Kaiser a good man. That is what I would do. It would serve him exactly right. End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six Susan Has a Proposal of Marriage. An aeroplane was flying over Glen St. Mary, like a great bird poised against the western sky, a sky so clear and of such a pale silvery yellow that it gave an impression of a vast, wind freshened space of freedom. The little group on the Ingleside lawn looked up at it with fascinated eyes, although it was by no means an unusual thing to see an occasional hovering plane that summer. Susan was always intensely excited. Who knew but that it might be Shirley, away up there in the clouds, flying over to the island from Kingsport? But Shirley had gone overseas now, so Susan was not so keenly interested in this particular aeroplane and its pilot. Nevertheless, she looked at it with awe. I wonder, Mrs. Dr. dear, she said solemnly, what the old folks down there in the graveyard would think if they could rise out of their graves for one moment and behold that sight. I am sure my father would disapprove of it, for he was a man who did not believe in newfangled ideas of any sort. He always cut his grain with a reaping hook to the day of his death. A mower he would not have. What was good enough for his father was good enough for him, he used to say. I hope it is not unfilial to say that I think he was wrong in that point of view. But I am not sure I go so far as to approve of aeroplanes, though there may be a military necessity. If the Almighty had meant us to fly, he would have provided us with wings. Since he did not, it is plain he meant us to stick to the solid earth. At any rate, you will never see me, Mrs. Dr. dear, cavorting through the sky in an aeroplane. But you won't refuse to cavort a bit in Father's new automobile when it comes, will you, Susan? teased Rilla. I do not expect to trust my old bones in automobiles either, retorted Susan. But I do not look upon them as some narrow-minded people do. Whiskers on the moon says the government should be turned out of office for permitting them to run on the island at all. He foams at the mouth, they tell me, when he sees one. The other day he saw one coming along the narrow side road by his wheat field, and Whiskers bounded over the fence and stood right in the middle of the road with his pitchfork. The man in the machine was an agent of some kind, and Whiskers hates agents as much as he hates automobiles. He made the car come to a halt because there was not room to pass him on either side and the agent could not actually run over him. Then he raised his pitchfork and shouted, Get out of this with your devil machine, or I will run this pitchfork clean through you. And, Mrs. Dr. dear, if you will believe me, that poor agent had to back his car clean out to the Lowbridge Road, nearly a mile, whiskers following him every step, shaking his pitchfork and bellowing insults. Now, Mrs. Dr. dear, I call such conduct unreasonable, but... All the same, added Susan with a sigh. Ah, uh, what with aeroplanes and automobiles and all the rest of it, this island is not what it used to be. The aeroplane soared and dipped and circled and soared again, until it became a mere speck far over the sunset hills. With the majesty of pinion which the Theban eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure fields of air, quoted Anne Blythe dreamily. I wonder, said Miss Oliver. If humanity will be any happier because of aeroplanes. It seems to me that the sum of human happiness remains much the same from age to age, no matter how it may vary in distribution, and that all their many inventions neither lessen nor increase it. After all, the kingdom of heaven is within you, said Mr. Meredith, gazing after the vanishing speck which symbolized man's latest victory in a world-old struggle. It does not depend on material achievements and triumphs. Nevertheless, an aeroplane is a fascinating thing, said the doctor. It has always been one of humanity's favorite dreams, the dream of flying. Dream after dream comes true, or rather is made true by persevering effort. I should like to have a flight in an aeroplane myself. Shirley wrote me that he was dreadfully disappointed in his first flight, said Rilla. He had expected to experience the sensation of soaring up from the earth like a bird, 
and instead he just had the feeling that it wasn't moving at all, but that the earth was dropping away under him. And the first time he went up alone he suddenly felt terribly homesick. He'd never felt like that before, but all at once, he said, he felt as if he were adrift in space, and he had a wild desire to get back home to the old planet in the companionship of fellow creatures. He soon got over that feeling, but he says his first flight alone was a nightmare to him because of that dreadful sensation of ghastly loneliness. The aeroplane disappeared. The doctor threw back his head with a sigh. When I have watched one of those bird men out of sight, I come back to earth with an odd feeling of being merely a crawling insect. Anne, he said, turning to his wife, do you remember the first time I took you for a buggy ride in Avonlea? That night we went to the Carmody concert, the first fall you taught in Avonlea. I had our little black mare with the white star on her forehead and a shining brand new buggy, and I was the proudest fellow in the world, barring none. I suppose our grandson will be taking his sweetheart out quite casually for an evening fly in his aeroplane. An aeroplane won't be as nice as little Silverspot was, said Anne. A machine is simply a machine. But Silverspot, why, she was a personality, Gilbert. A drive behind her had something in it that not even a flight among sunset clouds could have. No, I don't envy my grandson's sweetheart after all. Mr. Meredith is right. The kingdom of heaven, and of love, and of happiness, doesn't depend on externals. Besides, said the doctor gravely, our said grandson will have to give most of his attention to the aeroplane. He won't be able to let the reins lie on its back while he gazes into his lady's eyes. And I have an awful suspicion that you can't run an aeroplane with one arm. No. The doctor shook his head. I believe I'd still prefer Silver Spot, after all. The Russian line broke again that summer, and Susan said bitterly that she had expected it ever since Kerensky had gone and got married. Far be it from me to decry the holy state of matrimony, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I felt that when a man was running a revolution he had his hands full, and should have postponed marriage until a more fitting season the russians are done for this time and there would be no sense in shutting our eyes to the fact but have you seen woodrow wilson's reply to the pope's peace proposals it is magnificent i really could not have expressed the rights of the matter better myself i feel that i can forgive wilson everything for it he knows the meanings of words and that you may tie to speaking of meanings have you heard the latest story about whiskers on the moon mrs dr dear it seems he was over at the lowbridge road school the other day and took a notion to examine the fourth class in spelling they have the summer term there yet you know with the spring and fall vacations being rather backward people on that road my niece ella baker goes to that school and she it was who told me the story the teacher was not feeling well having a dreadful headache and she went out to get a little fresh air while mr pryor was examining the class the children got along all right with the spelling but when whiskers began to question them about the meanings of the words they were all at sea because they had not learned them ella and the other big scholars felt terrible over it they love their teachers so and it seems mr pryor's brother abel pryor who is trustee of that school is against her and has been trying to turn the other trustees over to his way of thinking and ella and the rest were afraid that if the fourth class couldn't tell whiskers the meanings of the words he would think the teacher was no good and tell abel so and Abel would have a fine handle. But little Sandy Logan saved the situation. He is a homeboy, but he is as smart as a steel trap, and he sized up Whiskers on the Moon right off. What does anatomy mean? Whiskers demanded. A pain in your stomach, Sandy replied, quick as a flash and never batting an eyelid. Whiskers on the Moon is a very ignorant man, Mrs. Dr. dear. He didn't know the meaning of the words himself, and he said, Very good, very good. The class caught right on. At least three or four of the brighter ones did, and they kept up the fun. Jean Blaine said that acoustic meant a religious struggle, and Muriel Baker said that an agnostic was a man who had indigestion, and Jim Carter said that a sermonty meant that you ain't nothing but vegetable food, and so on all down the list. Whiskers swallowed it all and kept saying, "Very good, very good." until Ella thought that die she would, trying to keep a straight face. When the teacher came in, Whiskers complimented her on the splendid understanding the children had of their lesson, and said he meant to tell the trustees what a jewel they had. 
it was very unusual he said to find a fourth class who could answer up so prompt when it came to explaining what words meant he went off beaming but ella told me this is a great secret mrs dr dear and we must keep it as such for the sake of the lowbridge road teacher it would likely be the ruin of her chances of keeping the school if whiskers should ever find out how he had been bamboozled mary vance came up to ingleside that same afternoon to tell them that miller douglas who had been wounded when the canadians took hill seventy had had to have his leg amputated the ingleside folk sympathized with mary whose zeal and patriotism had taken some time to kindle but now burned with a glow as steady and bright as any one's some folks have been twitting me about having a husband with only one leg but said mary rising to a lofty height i would rather miller with only one leg than any other man in the world with a dozen unless she added as an afterthought unless it was lloyd george well i must be going i thought you'd be interested in hearing about miller so i ran up from the store but i must hustle home for i promised luke mcallister i'd help him build his grain stack this evening it's up to us girls to see that the harvest is got in since the boys are so scarce i've got overalls and i can tell you they're real becoming mrs alec douglas says they're indecent and shouldn't be allowed and even mrs elliot kinder looks askance at them but bless you the world moves and anyhow there's no fun for me like shocking kitty alec by the way father said rilla i'm going to take jack flagg's place in his father's store for a month i promised him today that i would if he didn't object then he can help the farmers get the harvest in i don't think i'd be much use in a harvest myself the lots of the girls are but i can set jack free while i do his work james isn't much bother in the daytime now and i'll always be home at night do you think you'll like weighing out sugar and beans and trafficking in butter and eggs said the doctor twinkling probably not that isn't the question it's just one way of doing my bit so rilla went behind mr flagg's counter for a month and susan went into albert crawford's oat fields i am as good as any of them yet she said proudly not a man of them can beat me when it comes to building a stack when i offered to help albert looked doubtful i am afraid the work will be too hard for you he said try me for a day and see said i i will do my darndest none of the ingleside folks spoke for just a moment the silence meant that they thought susan's pluck in working out was quite wonderful but susan mistook their meaning and her sunburned face grew red the habit of swearing seems to be growing on me mrs dr dear she said apologetically to think that i should be acquiring it at my age it is such a dreadful example to the young girls i am of the opinion it comes of reading the newspapers so much they are so full of profanity and they do not spell it with stars either as used to be done in my young days this war is demoralizing everybody susan standing on a load of grain her gray hair whipping in the breeze and her skirt kilted up to her knees for safety and convenience no overalls for susan if you please neither a beautiful nor a romantic figure but the spirit that animated her gaunt arms was the self-same one that captured vimy ridge and held the german legions back from verdun it is not the least likely however that this consideration was the one which appealed most strongly to mr pryor when he drove past one afternoon and saw susan pitching sheaves gamely smart woman that he reflected worth two of many a younger one yet i might do worse i might do worse if milgrave comes home alive i'll lose miranda and hired housekeepers cost more than a wife and are liable to leave a man in the lurch at any time i'll think it over a week later mrs blythe coming out from the village late in the afternoon paused at the gate of ingleside in an amazement which temporarily bereft her of the power of motion an extraordinary sight met her eyes round the end of the kitchen burst mr pryor running as stout pompous mr pryor had not run in years with terror imprinted on every lineament a terror quite justifiable for behind him like an avenging fate came susan with a huge smoking iron pot grasped in her hands and an expression in her eye that boded ill to the object of her indignation if she should overtake him pursuer and pursued tore across the lawn mr pryor reached the gate a few feet ahead of susan wrenched it open and fled down the road without a glance at the transfixed lady of ingleside susan gasped anne susan halted in her mad career set down her pot and shook her fist after mr pryor who had not ceased to run 
evidently believing that Susan was still full cry after him. "'Susan, what does this mean?' demanded Anne, a little severely. "'You may well ask that, Mrs. Dr. dear,' Susan replied wrathfully. "'I have not been so upset in years. That, that, that pacifist has actually had the audacity to come up here and, in my own kitchen, to ask me to marry him. Him!' Anne choked back a laugh. "'But, Susan, could you have found a, well, a less spectacular method of refusing him? Think what a gossip this would have made if anyone had been going past and had seen such a performance.' "'Indeed, Mrs. Dr. dear, you are quite right. I did not think of it because I was quite past thinking rationally. I was just clean mad. Come into the house, and I will tell you all about it.' Susan picked up her pot and marched into the kitchen, still trembling with wrathful excitement. She set her pot on the stove with a vicious thud. "'Wait a moment until I open all the windows to air this kitchen well, Mrs. Dr. dear. There, that is better. And I must wash my hands, too, because I shook hands with whiskers on the moon when he came in. Not that I wanted to. But when he stuck out his fat, oily hand, I did not know just what else to do at the moment. I had just finished my afternoon cleaning, and, thanks be, everything was shining and spotless.' and thought i now that dye is boiling and i will get my rug rags and have them nicely out of the way before supper just then a shadow fell over the floor and looking up i saw whiskers on the moon standing in the doorway dressed up and looking as if he had just been starched and ironed i shook hands with him as aforesaid mrs dr dear and told him you and the doctor were both away but he said i have come to see you miss baker i asked him to sit down for the sake of my own manners and then i stood there right in the middle of the floor and gazed at him as contemptuously as i could in spite of his brazen assurance this seemed to rattle him a little but he began trying to look sentimental at me out of his little piggy eyes and all at once an awful suspicion flashed into my mind something told me mrs dr dear that i was about to receive my first proposal i have always thought that i would like to have just one offer of marriage to reject so that i might be able to look other women in the face but you will not hear me bragging of this i consider it an insult and if i could have thought of any way of preventing it i would but just then mrs dr dear you will see i was at a disadvantage being taken so completely by surprise some men i am told consider a little preliminary courting the proper thing before a proposal if only to give fair warning of their intentions but whiskers on the moon probably thought it was any port in a storm for me and that i would jump at him well he is undeceived yes he is undeceived mrs dr dear i wonder if he has stopped running yet i understand that you don't feel flattered susan but couldn't you have refused him a little more delicately than by chasing him off the premises in such a fashion well maybe i might have mrs dr dear and i intended to but one remark he made aggravated me beyond my powers of endurance if it had not been for that i would not have chased him with my dye pot i will tell you the whole interview whiskers sat down as i have said and right beside him on another chair doc was lying the animal was pretending to be asleep but i know very well he was not for he has been hide all day and hide never sleeps by the way mrs dr dear have you noticed that that cat is far oftener hyde than jekyll now the more victories germany wins the hider he becomes i leave you to draw your own conclusions from that i suppose whiskers thought he might curry favour with me by praising the creature little dreaming what my real sentiments towards it were so he stuck out his pudgy hand and stroked mr hyde's back what a nice cat he said the nice cat flew at him and bit him. Then it gave a fearful yowl and bounded out of the door. Whiskers looked after it, quite amazed. "'That is a queer kind of varmint,' he said. I agreed with him on that point, but I was not going to let him see it. Besides, what business had he to call our cat a varmint? "'It may be a varmint or it may not,' I said. "'But it knows the difference between a Canadian and a Hun.' you would have thought would you not mrs dr dear that a hint like that would have been enough for him but it went no deeper than his skin i saw him settling back quite comfortable as if for a good talk and thought i if there is anything coming it may as well come soon and be done with for with all these rags to die before supper i have no time to waste in flirting so i spoke right out 
if you have anything particular to discuss with me mr pryor i would feel obliged if you would mention it without loss of time because i am very busy this afternoon he fairly beamed at me out of that circle of red whisker and said you are a business-like woman and i agree with you there is no use in wasting time beating around the bush i came up here to-day to ask you to marry me so there it was mrs dr dear i had a proposal at last after waiting sixty-four years for one i just glared at that presumptuous creature and i said i would not marry you if you were the last man on earth josiah pryor so there you have my answer and you can take it away forthwith you never saw a man so taken aback as he was mrs dr dear he was so flabbergasted that he just blurted out the truth why i thought you'd be only too glad to get a chance to be married he said that was when i lost my head mrs dr dear do you think i had a good excuse when a hun and a pacifist made such an insulting remark to me go i thundered and i just caught up that iron pot i could see that he thought i had suddenly gone insane and i suppose he considered an iron pot full of boiling dye was a dangerous weapon in the hands of a lunatic at any rate he went and stood not upon the order of his going as you saw for yourself and i do not think we will see him back here proposing to us again in a hurry no i think he has learned that there is at least one single woman in glen st mary who has no hankering to become mrs whiskers on the moon End of chapter 26「ちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょっと待ってちょ It's been very hard to keep our courage alight of late. The Caporetta disaster is a dreadful thing, and not even Susan can extract much consolation out of the present state of affairs. The rest of us don't try. Gertrude keeps saying desperately, They must not get to Venice. They must not get to Venice. As if by saying it often enough she can prevent them. But what is to prevent them from getting Venice I cannot see. Yet, as Susan fails not to point out, there was seemingly nothing to prevent them from getting to Paris in 1914, yet they did not get it. And she affirms that they shall not get Venice either. Oh, how I hope and pray they will not! Venice, the beautiful queen of the Adriatic! Although I've never seen it, I feel about it just as Byron did. I've always loved it. It has always been to me a fairy city of the heart. Perhaps I caught my love of it from Walter, who worshipped it. It was always one of his dreams to see Venice. I remember we planned once, down in Rainbow Valley one evening, just before the war broke out, that sometime we would go together to see it, and float in a gondola through its moonlit streets. Every fall since the war began, there has been some terrible blow to our troops Antwerp in 1914, Serbia in 1915, last fall, Romania, and now Italy, the worst of all. I think I would give up in despair if it were not what Walter said in his dear last letter that the dead as well as the living were fighting on our side, and such an army cannot be defeated. No, it cannot. We will win in the end. I will not doubt it for one moment. To let myself doubt would be to break faith. We have all been campaigning furiously of late for the new victory loan. We junior Reds canvassed diligently and landed several tough old customers who had at first flatly refused to invest. I, even I, tackled Whiskers on the Moon. I expected a bad time and a refusal, but to my amazement he was quite agreeable and promised on the spot to take a thousand dollar bond. He may be a pacifist, but he knows a good investment when it's handed out to him. Five and a half percent is five and a half percent, even when a militaristic government pays it. Father, to tease Susan, says, It was her speech at the Victory Loan Campaign meeting that converted Mr. Pryor. I don't think that at all likely, since Mr. Pryor has been publicly very bitter against Susan ever since her quite unmistakable rejection of his lover like advances. But Susan did make a speech, and the best one made at the meeting, too. It was the first time she ever did such a thing, and she vows it will be the last. Everybody in the Glen was at the meeting. And quite a number of speeches were made, but somehow things were a little flat, 
no especial enthusiasm could be worked up. Susan was quite dismayed at the lack of zeal because she had been burningly anxious that the island should go over the top in regard to its quota. She kept whispering viciously to Gertrude and me that there was no ginger in the speeches, and when nobody went forward to subscribe to the loan at the close, Susan lost her head. At least that's how she describes it herself. She bounded to her feet, her face grim and set under her bonnet. Susan is the only woman in Glen St. Mary who still wears a bonnet and said sarcastically and loudly, No doubt it is much cheaper to talk patriotism than it is to pay for it, and we are asking charity, of course. We are asking you to lend us your money for nothing. No doubt the Kaiser will feel quite downcast when he hears of this meeting. Susan has an unshaken belief that the Kaiser's spies, presumably represented by Mr. Pryor, promptly inform him of everything happening in our glen. Norman Douglas shouted out, Hear, hear! and some boy at the back said, "'What about Lloyd George?' in a tone Susan didn't like. "'Lloyd George is her pet hero, now that Kitchener is gone.' "'I stand behind Lloyd George every time,' retorted Susan. "'I suppose that will hearten him up greatly,' said Warren Mead with one of his disagreeable, "'Ha, ha!' Warren's remark was sparked to powder. Susan just "'Sailed in,' as she puts it, and "'Said her say.' She said it remarkably well, too. There was no lack of ginger in her speech, anyhow. When Susan's warmed up, she has no mean powers of oratory, and the way she trimmed those men down was funny and wonderful and effective all at once. She said, It was the likes of her, millions of her, that did stand behind Lloyd George, and did hearten him up. That was the keynote of her speech. Dear old Susan, she is a perfect dynamo of patriotism and loyalty and contempt for slackers of all kinds, and when she let it loose on that audience in her one grand outburst, she electrified it. Susan always vows, She is no suffragette, but she gave womanhood its due that night. And she literally made those men cringe. When she finished with them, they were ready to eat out of her hand. She wound up by ordering them, yes, ordering them, to march up to the platform forthwith and subscribe for victory bonds. And after wild applause, most of them did it, even Warren Mead. When the total amount subscribed came out in the Charlottetown dailies the next day, we found that the Glen led every district on the island, and certainly Susan has the credit for it. She herself, after she came home that night, was quite ashamed and evidently feared that she had been guilty of unbecoming conduct. She confessed to Mother that she had been rather unladylike. We were all, except Susan, out for a trial ride in Father's new automobile tonight. A very good one we had, too. Though we did get ingloriously ditched at the end, owing to a certain grim old dame, to wit, Miss Elizabeth Carr of the Upper Glen, who wouldn't rein her horse out to let us pass, honk as we might. Father was quite furious, but in my heart I believe I sympathized with Miss Elizabeth. If I had been a spinster lady, driving along behind my own old nag and maiden meditation fancy free, I wouldn't have lifted a rang when an obstreperous car hooted blatantly behind me. I should have sat up just as dourly as she did and said, Take the ditch if you are determined to pass. We did take the ditch, and got up to our axes in sand, and sat foolishly there while Miss Elizabeth clucked up her horse and rattled victoriously away. Jem will have a laugh when I write him this. He knows Miss Elizabeth of old. But will Venice be saved? 19th November, 1917 It is not saved yet. It is still in great danger. But the Italians are making a stand at last on the Paiave line. To be sure, military critics say they cannot possibly hold it and must retreat to the Adige. But Susan and Gertrude and I say they must hold it, because Venice must be saved. So what are the military critics to do? Oh, if I could only believe that they can hold it! Our Canadian troops have won another great victory. They have stormed the Passchendaele Ridge and held it in the face of all counterattacks. None of our boys were in the battle, but, oh, the casualty list of other people's boys. Joe Milgrave was in it, but came through safe. Miranda had some bad days until she got word from him. But it's wonderful how Miranda has bloomed out since her marriage. She isn't the same girl at all. Even her eyes seem to have darkened and deepened, though I suppose that is just because they glow with the greater intensity that has come to her. She makes her father stand round in a perfectly amazing fashion. She runs up the flag whenever a yard of trench on the western front is taken, and she comes up regularly to our junior Red Cross, 
and she does, yes, she does, put on funny little married woman airs that are quite killing. But she's the only war bride in the Glen, and surely nobody need grudge her the satisfaction she gets out of it. The Russian news is bad, too. Kerensky's government has fallen, and Lenin is the dictator of Russia. Somehow it's very hard to keep up courage in the dull hopelessness of these grey autumn days of suspense and boding news. But we are beginning to... Get in a lull. As old Highland Sandy says, over the approaching election. Conscription is the real issue at stake, and it will be the most exciting election we ever had. All the women who have got de age, to quote Joe Poyer, and who have husbands, sons, and brothers at the front can vote. Oh, if I were only twenty-one! Gertrude and Susan are both furious because they can't vote. It is not fair, Gertrude says passionately. There is Agnes Carr who can vote because her husband went. She did everything she could to prevent him from going, and now she is going to vote against the Union government. Yet I have no vote, because my man at the front is only my sweetheart and not my husband. As for Susan, when she reflects that she cannot vote, while a rankled pacifist like Mr. Pryor can and will, her comments are sulphurous. I really feel sorry for the Elliots and Crawfords and McAllisters over harbour. They've always lined up in clearly divided camps, of liberal and conservative, and now they're torn from their moorings, I know I'm mixing my metaphors dreadfully, and set hopelessly adrift. It will kill some of those old grits to vote for Sir Robert Borden's side, and yet they have to because they believe the time has come when we must have conscription. And some poor conservatives who are against conscription must vote for Laurier, who's always been anathema to them. Some of them are taking it terribly hard. Others seem to be in much the same attitude as Mrs. Marshall Elliott has come to be regarding church union. She was up here last night. She doesn't come as often as she used to. She's growing too old to walk this far. Dear old Miss Cornelia. I hate to think of her growing old. We've always loved her so, and she's always been so good to us Ingleside young fry. She used to be so bitterly opposed to church union. But last night, when Father told her it was practically decided, she said in a resigned tone, Well, in a world where everything is being rent and torn, what matters one more rending and tearing? Anyhow, compared with Germans, even Methodists seem attractive to me. Our junior R.C. goes on quite smoothly, in spite of the fact that Irene has come back to it, having fallen out with the Lowbird Society, I understand. She gave me a sweet little jab last meeting about knowing me across the square in Charlottetown by my green velvet hat. Everybody knows me by that detestable and detested hat. This will be my fourth season for it. Even Mother wanted me to get a new one this fall, but I said no. As long as the war lasts, so long do I wear that velvet hat in winter. 23rd November, 1917 the P.A. flying still holds, and General Bing has won a splendid victory at Cambrai. I did run up the flag for that. But Susan only said, I shall set a kettle of water on the kitchen range tonight. I notice little Kitchener always has an attack of croup after any British victory. I do hope he has no pro-German blood in his veins. Nobody knows much about his father's people. Jim's has had a few attacks of croup this fall, just the ordinary croup, not that terrible thing he had last year. But whatever blood runs in his little veins is good, healthy blood. He's rosy and plump and curly and cute, and he says such funny things and asks such comical questions. He likes very much to sit in a special chair in the kitchen, but that's Susan's favorite chair, too, and when she wants it, out Jim's must go. The last time she put him out of it, he turned around and asked solemnly, When you are dead, Susan, can I sit in that chair? Susan thought it quite dreadful and I think that was when she began to feel anxiety about his possible ancestry. The other night I took Jims with me for a walk down to the shore. It was the first time he'd ever been out so late at night, and when he saw the stars he exclaimed, Oh, Rilla, see the big moon and all the little moons. And last Wednesday morning, when he woke up, my little alarm clock had stopped because I'd forgotten to wind it up. Jims bounded out of his crib and ran across to me, his face quite aghast above his little blue flannel pajamas. The clock is dead, he gasped. Oh, Willa, the clock is dead. One night he was quite angry with both Susan and me because we would not give him something he wanted very much. When he said his prayers, he plumped down wrathfully, and when he came to the petition, Make me a good boy, he tacked on emphatically, And please make Willa and Susan good because they're not. 
I don't go about quoting Jim's speeches to all I meet. That always bores me when other people do it. I just enshrine them in this old hotchpotch of a journal. This very evening, as I put Jim's to bed, he looked up and asked me gravely, Why can't yesterday come back, Willa? Oh, why can't it, Jim's? That beautiful yesterday of dreams and laughter, when our boys were home, when Walter and I read and rambled and watched new moons and sunsets together in Rainbow Valley. If it could just come back. But yesterdays never come back, little Jim's, and the todays are dark with clouds, and we dare not think about the tomorrows. 11th December, 1917 Wonderful news came today. The British troops captured Jerusalem today. We ran up the flag, and some of Gertrude's old sparkle came back to her for a moment. After all, she said, it is worth while to live in the days which see the object of the Crusades attained. The ghosts of all the Crusaders must have crowded the walls of Jerusalem last night, with Coeur de Lyon at their head. Susan had cause for satisfaction also. I am so thankful I can pronounce Jerusalem and Hebron, she said. They give me a real comfortable feeling, after Premisel and brest Well, we have got the Turks on the run, at least, and Venice is safe, and Lord Lansdowne is not to be taken seriously, and I see no reason why we should be downhearted. Jerusalem, the meteor flag of England floats over you. The crescent is gone. How Walter would have thrilled over that! 18th December, 1917 Yesterday the election came off. In the evening, Mother and Susan and Gertrude and I foregathered in the living room and waited in breathless suspense, Father having gone down to the village. We had no way of hearing the news, for Carter Flagg's store is not in our line, and when we tried to get it central, always answered that the line was busy, as no doubt it was, for everybody for miles around was trying to get Carter's store for the same reason we were. About ten o'clock, Gertrude went to the phone and happened to catch someone from over harbor talking to Carter Flagg. Gertrude shamelessly listened in and got for her comforting what eavesdroppers are proverbially supposed to get. To wit, unpleasant hearing, the Union government had done nothing in the West. We looked at each other in dismay. If the government had failed to carry the West, it was defeated. Canada is disgraced in the eyes of the world, said Gertrude bitterly. If everybody was like the Mark Crawfords over harbour, this would not have happened, groaned Susan. They locked their uncle up in the barn this morning and would not let him out until he promised to vote union. That is what I call an effective argument, Mrs. Dr. dear. Gertrude and I couldn't rest after all that. We walked the floor until our legs gave out and we had to sit down perforce. Mother knitted away as steadily as clockwork and pretended to be calm and serene pretended so well that we were all deceived and envious until the next day, when I caught her raveling out four inches of her sock. She had knit that far past where the heel should have begun. It was twelve before father came home. He stood in the doorway and looked at us, and we looked at him. We did not dare ask him what the news was. Then he said that it was Laurier who had done nothing in the West, and that the Union government was in with a big majority. Gertrude clapped her hands, I wanting to laugh and cry. Mother's eyes flashed with their old-time starriness, and Susan emitted a queer sound between a gasp and a whoop. This will not comfort the Kaiser much, she said. Then we went to bed, but we were too excited to sleep. Really, as Susan said solemnly this morning, Mrs. Dr. dear, I think politics are too strenuous for women. 31st December, 1917 Our fourth war Christmas is over. We're trying to gather up some courage wherewith to face another year of it. Germany has, for the most part, been victorious all summer. And now, they say, she has all her troops from the Russian front ready for a big push in the spring. Sometimes it seems to me that we just cannot live through the winter waiting for that. I had a great batch of letters from overseas this week. Shirley's at the front now, too, and writes about it all as coolly and matter-of-factly as he used to write a football at Queen's. Carl wrote that it had been raining for weeks, and that nights in the trenches always made him think of the night of long ago, when he did penance in the graveyard for running away from Henry Warren's ghost. Carl's letters are always full of jokes and bits of fun. They had a great rat hunt the night before, he wrote, spearing rats with their bayonets, and he got the best bag and won the prize. He has a tame rat that knows him and sleeps in his pocket at night. Rats don't worry, Carl, as they do some people. He was always chummy with all little beasts. He says, He is making a study of the habits of the trench rat 
and means to write a treatise on it some day that will make him famous. Ken wrote a short letter. His letters are all rather short now, and he doesn't often slip in those dear, silent little sentences I love so much. Sometimes I think he's forgotten all about the night he was here to say goodbye. And then there will be just a line or a word that makes me think he remembers and always will remember. For instance, today's letter hadn't a thing in it that might have been written to any girl, except that he signed himself your Kenneth instead of yours Kenneth, as he usually does. Now did he leave that S off intentionally, or was it only carelessness? I shall lie awake half the night wondering. He's a captain now. I'm glad and proud, and yet Captain Ford sounds so horribly far away and high up. Ken and Captain Ford seem like two different persons. I may be practically engaged to Ken. Mother's opinion on that is my stay in bulwark. But I can't be to Captain Ford. And Jem is a lieutenant now, won his promotion on the field. He sent me a snapshot, taken in his new uniform. He looks thin and old. Old! My boy brother Jem! I can't forget Mother's face when I showed it to her. That, my little Jem, the baby of the house of dreams, was all she said. There was a letter from Faith, too. She's doing V.A.D. work in England and writes hopefully and brightly. I think she's almost happy. She saw Jem on his last leave, and she's so near him she could go to him if he were wounded. That means so much to her. Oh, if I were only with her. But my work is here at home. I know Walter wouldn't have wanted me to leave Mother, and in everything I try to keep faith with him, even to the little details of daily life. Walter died for Canada. I must live for her. That is what he asked me to do. 28th January, 1918 I shall anchor my storm-tossed soul to the British fleet and make a batch of bran biscuits, said Susan today to Cousin Sophia, who had come in with some weird tale of a new and all-conquering submarine, just launched by Germany. But Susan is a somewhat disgruntled woman at present, owing to the regulations regarding cookery. Her loyalty to the Union government is being sorely tried. It surmounted the first strain gallantly. When the order about flour came, Susan said, quite cheerfully, I am an old dog to be learning new tricks, but I shall learn to make war bread if it will help defeat the Huns. But the later suggestions went against Susan's grain. Had it not been for father's decree, I think she would have snapped her fingers at Sir Robert Borden. Talk about trying to make bricks without straw, Mrs. Dr. Dear. How am I to make a cake without butter or sugar? It cannot be done. Not cake that is cake. Of course one can make a slab, Mrs. Dr. Dear. And we cannot even camouflage it with a little icing. To think that I should have lived to see the day when a government at Ottawa should step into my kitchen and put me on rations. Susan would give the last drop of her blood for her king and country, but to surrender her beloved recipes is a very different and much more serious matter. I had letters from Nan and Di, too, or, rather, notes. They're too busy to write letters, for exams are looming up. They will graduate in arts this spring. I am evidently to be the dunce of the family. But somehow I never had any hankering for a college course, and even now it doesn't appeal to me. I'm afraid I'm rather devoid of ambition. There's only one thing I really want to be, and I don't know if I'll be it or not. If not, I don't want to be anything. But I shan't write it down. It is all right to think it. But as Cousin Sophia would say, It might be brazen to write it down. I will write it down. I want to be cowed by the conventions and Cousin Sophia. I want to be Kenneth Ford's wife. There now. I've just looked in the glass, and I hadn't the sign of a blush on my face. I suppose I'm not a properly constructed damsel at all. I was down to see Little Dog Monday today. He's grown quite stiff and rheumatic, but there he sat, waiting for the train. He thumped his tail and looked pleadingly into my eyes. When will Jim come? seemed to say. Oh, Dog Monday, there is no answer to that question, and there is, as yet— no answer to the other, which we are all constantly asking. What will happen when Germany strikes again on the Western Front? Her one great last blow for victory! 1st March, 1918 What will spring bring? Gertrude said today. I dread it, as I never dreaded spring before. Do you suppose there will ever again come a time when life will be free from fear? 
for almost four years we have lain down with fear and risen up with it. It has been the unbidden guest at every meal, the unwelcome companion at every gathering. Hindenburg says he will be in Paris on 1st of April, sighed Cousin Sophia. Hindenburg? There is no power in pen and ink to express the contempt which Susan infused into that name. Has he forgotten what day the 1st of April is? Hindenburg has kept his word hitherto said Gertrude, as gloomily as Cousin Sophia herself could have said it. "'Yes, fighting against the Russians and Romanians,' retorted Susan. "'Wait you till he comes up against the British and French, not to speak of the Yankees, who are getting there as fast as they can, and will no doubt give a good account of themselves.' "'You said just the same thing before Mons, Susan,' I reminded her. "'Hindenburg says he will spend a million lives to break the Allied front,' said Gertrude." at such a price he must purchase some success and how can we live through them even if he is baffled in the end these past two months when we have been crouching and waiting for the blow to fall have seemed as long as all the preceding months of the war put together i work all day feverishly and waken at three o'clock at night to wonder if the iron legions have struck at last it is then i see hindenburg in paris and germany triumphant I never see her so at any other time than that accursed hour. Susan looked dubious over Gertrude's adjective, but evidently concluded that the A saved the situation. I wish it were possible to take some magic draught and go to sleep for the next three months, and then wake to find Armageddon over, said Mother almost impatiently. It is not often that Mother slumps into a wish like that, or at least the verbal expression of it. Mother has changed a great deal since that terrible day in September when we knew that Walter would not come back. But she's always been brave and patient. Now it seemed as if even she had reached the limit of her endurance. Susan went over to Mother and touched her shoulder. Do not you be frightened or downhearted, Mrs. Dr. dear, she said gently. I felt somewhat that way myself last night, and I rose from my bed and lighted my lamp and opened my Bible. And what do you think was the first verse my eyes lighted upon? It was, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord of hosts, to deliver thee. I am not gifted in the way of dreaming as Miss Oliver is, but I knew then and there, Mrs. Dr. dear, that it was a manifest leading, and that Hindenburg will never see Paris. So I read no further, but went back to my bed, and I did not waken at three o'clock or at any other hour before morning. I say that verse Susan read over and over again to myself. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the spirits of all just men made perfect, and even the legions and guns that Germany is massing on the western front must break against such a barrier. This is in certain uplifted moments, but when other moments come, I feel like Gertrude that— I cannot endure any longer this awful and ominous hush before the coming storm. 23rd March, 1918. Armageddon has begun! The last great fight of all! Is it, I wonder? Yesterday I went down to the post office for the mail. It was a dull, bitter day. The snow was gone, but the grey, lifeless ground was frozen hard, and a biting wind was blowing. The whole glen landscape was ugly and hopeless. Then I got the paper with its big black headlines. Germany struck on the 21st. She makes big claims of guns and prisoners taken. General Haig reports that severe fighting continues. I don't like the sound of that last expression. We all find we cannot do any work that requires concentration of thought. So we all knit furiously because we can do that mechanically. At least the dreadful waiting is over, the horrible wondering where and when the blow will fall. It has fallen, but they shall not prevail against us. Oh, what is happening on the Western Front tonight as I write this, sitting here in my room with my journal before me? Jim's is asleep in his crib, and the wind is wailing around the window. Over my desk hangs Walter's picture, looking at me with his beautiful deep eyes. The Mona Lisa he gave me the last Christmas he was home hangs on one side of it, and on the other a framed copy of The Piper. It seems to me that I can hear Walter's voice repeating it, that little poem into which he put his soul, and which will live there forever, carrying Walter's name on through the future of our land. Everything about me is calm and peaceful and homey. Walter seems very near to me. If I could just sweep aside the thin, wavering little veil that hangs between, I could see him, just as he saw the Pied Piper the night before Corselet. 
over there in France tonight. Does the line hold? End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight Black Sunday. In March of the Year of Grace, nineteen eighteen, there was one week into which must have crowded more of searing human agony than any seven days had ever held before in the history of the world. And in that week there was one day when all humanity seemed nailed to the cross. On that day the whole planet must have been a groan with universal convulsion. Everywhere the hearts of men were failing them for fear. It dawned calmly and coldly and grayly at Ingleside. Mrs. Blythe and Rilla and Miss Oliver made ready for church in a suspense tempered by hope and confidence. The doctor was away, having been summoned during the wee smas to Marwood household in Upper Glen, where little Warbride was fighting gallantly on her own battleground to give life, not death, to the world. Susan announced that she meant to stay home that morning. A rare decision for Susan. But I would rather not go to church this morning, Mrs. Dr. dear, she explained. If Whiskers on the Moon were there, and I saw him looking holy and pleased, as he always looks when he thinks the Huns are winning, I fear I would lose my patience and my sense of decorum, and hurl a Bible or hymn book at him, thereby disgracing myself and the sacred edifice. No, Mrs. Dr. dear, I shall stay home from church till the tide turns, and pray hard here. I think I might as well stay home too, for all the good church will do me today, Miss Oliver said to Rilla as they walked down the hard-frozen red road to the church. I can think nothing but a question. Does the line still hold? Next Sunday will be Easter, said Rilla. Will it herald death or life to our cause? Mr. Meredith preached that morning from the text, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. And hope and confidence rang through his inspiring sentences. Rilla, looking up at the memorial tablet on the wall above their pew, sacred to the memory of walter cuthbert blythe felt herself lifted out of her dread and filled anew with courage walter could not have laid down his life for naught his had been the gift of prophetic vision and he had foreseen victory she would cling to that belief the line would hold in this renewed mood she walked home from church almost gaily the others too were hopeful and all went smiling into ingleside there was no one in the living room save jims who had fallen asleep on the sofa and Doc, who sat hushed in grim repose on the hearthrug, looking very hidish indeed. No one was in the dining room either, and stranger still, no dinner was on the table, which was not even set. Where was Susan? Can she have taken ill? exclaimed Mrs. Blythe anxiously. I thought it strange that she did not want to go to church this morning. The kitchen door opened, and Susan appeared on the threshold with such a ghastly face that Mrs. Blythe cried out in sudden panic, Susan, what is it? The British line is broken, and the German shells are falling on Paris, said Susan dully. The three women stared at each other, stricken. It's not true. It's not, gasped Rilla. The thing would be ridiculous, said Gertrude Oliver, and then she laughed horribly. Susan, who told you this? When did the news come? asked Mrs. Blythe. I got it over the long-distance phone from Charlottetown half an hour ago said susan the news came to town last night it was dr holland phoned it out and he said it was only too true since then i have done nothing mrs dr dear i am very sorry dinner is not ready it is the first time i have been so remiss uh, if you will be patient i will soon have something for you to eat but i am afraid i let the potatoes burn dinner nobody wants any dinner susan said mrs blythe wildly oh this thing is unbelievable it must be a nightmare Paris is lost. France is lost. The war is lost, gasped Rilla amid the utter ruins of hope and confidence and belief. Oh, God! Oh, God! moaned Gertrude Oliver, walking about the room and wringing her hands. Oh, God! Nothing else, no other words, nothing but that age-old plea, the old, old cry of supreme agony and appeal from the human heart whose every human staff has failed it. Is God dead? 
asked a startled little voice from the doorway of the living room. Jim stood there, flushed from sleep, his big brown eyes filled with dread. Oh, Willa, oh, Willa, is God dead? Miss Oliver stopped walking and exclaiming and stared at Jim's, in whose eyes tears of fright were beginning to gather. Rilla ran to his comforting, while Susan bounded up from the chair upon which she had dropped. No, she said briskly, with a sudden return of her real self. No, God isn't dead, nor Lloyd George either. We were forgetting that, Mrs. Dr. dear. Don't cry, little Kitchener. Bad as things are, they might be worse. The British line may be broken, but the British Navy is not. Let us tie to that. I will take a brace and get up a bite to eat, for strength we must have. They made a pretense of eating Susan's bite, but it was only a pretense. Nobody at Ingleside ever forgot that black afternoon. Gertrude Oliver walked the floor. They all walked the floor, except Susan, who got out her grey war sock. Mrs. Dr. dear, I must knit on Sunday at last. I have never dreamed of doing it before, for, say what might be said, I have considered it was a violation of the third commandment. But whether it is or whether it is not, I must knit today, or I shall go mad. Knit if you can, Susan, said Mrs. Blythe restlessly. I would knit if I could, but I cannot, I cannot. If we could only get fuller information, moaned Rilla. There might be something to encourage us, if we knew all. We know that Germans are shelling Paris, said Miss Oliver bitterly. In that case they must have smashed through everywhere, and be at the very gates. No, we have lost. Let us face the fact, as other peoples in the past have had to face it. Other nations, with right on their side, have given their best and bravest, and gone down to defeat in spite of it. Ours is but one more to baffled millions who have gone before. I won't give up like that, cried Rilla, her pale face suddenly flushing. I won't despair. We're not conquered. No, if Germany overruns all France, we are not conquered. I am ashamed of myself for this hour of despair. You won't see me slump like that again. I'm going to ring up town at once and ask for particulars. But town could not be got. The long-distance operator there was submerged by similar calls from every part of the distracted country. Rilla finally gave up and slipped away to Rainbow Valley. There she knelt down on the withered grey grasses in the little nook where she and Walter had had their last talk together, with her head bowed against the mossy trunk of a fallen tree. The sun had broken through the black clouds and drenched the valley with a pale golden splendor. The bells and the tree lovers twinkled elfinly and fitfully in the gusty March wind. "'Oh, God, give me strength,' Rilla whispered. "'Just strength and courage.' And like a child, she clasped her hands together and said, as simply as Jim's could have done, Please send us better news tomorrow. She knelt there a long time, and when she went back to Ingleside, she was calm and resolute. The doctor had arrived home, tired but triumphant, little Douglas Hag Marwood having made a safe landing on the shores of time. Gertrude was still pacing restlessly, but Mrs. Blythe and Susan had reacted from the shock, and Susan was already planning a new line of defense for the Channel ports. As long as we can hold them, she declared, the situation is saved. Paris has really no military significance. Don't, said Gertrude sharply, as if Susan had run something into her. She thought the old worn phrase, no military significance, nothing short of ghastly mockery under the circumstances, and more terrible to endure than the voice of despair would have been. I heard up at Marwood's of the line being broken, said the doctor. But this story of the Germans shelling Paris seems to be rather incredible. Even if they broke through, they were fifty miles from Paris at the nearest point. And how could they get their artillery close enough to shell it in so short a time? Depend upon it, girls. That part of the message can't be true. I'm going to try a long-distance call to town myself. The doctor was no more successful than Rilla had been, but his point of view cheered them all a little and helped them through the evening and at nine o'clock a long-distance message came through at last that helped them through the night the line broke only in one place before st quentin said the doctor as he hung up the receiver and the british troops are retreating in good order that's not so bad as for the shells that are falling on paris they are coming from a distance of seventy miles from some amazing long-distance gun the germans have invented and sprung with the opening offensive that is all the news to date, and Dr. Holland says it is reliable. 
"'It would have been dreadful news yesterday,' said Gertrude. "'But compared to what we heard this morning, it is almost like good news. But still,' she added, trying to smile, "'I am afraid I will not sleep much to-night.' "'There is one thing to be thankful for at any rate, Miss Oliver, dear,' said Susan. "'And that is that Cousin Sophia did not come in to-day. I really could not have endured her on top of all the rest.' End of chapter 28「Of Rilla of Ingleside」by Lucy Maud Montgomery This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 Wounded and Missing Battered but not broken was the headline in Monday's paper, and Susan repeated it over and over to herself as she went about her work. The gap caused by the St. Quentin disaster had been patched up in time, but the Allied line was pushed relentlessly back from the territory they had purchased in 1917 with half a million lives. On Wednesday the headline was, British and French Czech Germans, but still the retreat went on. Back and back and back. Where would it end? Would the line break again, this time disastrously? On Saturday the headline was, Even Berlin Admits Offensive Checked and for the first time in that terrible week the ingleside folk dared to draw a long breath well we have got one week over now for the next said susan staunchly i feel like a prisoner on the rack when they stopped turning it miss oliver said to rilla as they went to church on easter morning but i am not off the rack the torture may begin again at any time i doubted god last sunday said rilla but i don't doubt him today evil cannot win the spirit is on our side, and it is bound to outlast flesh. Nevertheless, her faith was often tried in the dark spring that followed. Armageddon was not, as they had hoped, a matter of a few days. It stretched out into weeks and months. Again and again, Hindenburg struck his savage sudden blows with alarming, though futile, success. Again and again, the military critics declared the situation extremely perilous. Again and again, Cousin Sophia agreed with the military critics. If the Allies go back three miles more, the war is lost, she wailed. Is the British Navy anchored in those three miles? demanded Susan scornfully. It is the opinion of a man who knows all about it, said Cousin Sophia solemnly. There is no such person, retorted Susan. As for the military critics, they do not know one blessed thing about it, any more than you or I. They have been mistaken times out of number. Why do you always look on the dark side, Sophia Crawford? Because there ain't any bright side, Susan Baker. Oh, is there not? It is the 20th of April, and Hindi is not in Paris yet, although he said he would be there by April 1st. Is that not a bright spot at least? It is my opinion that the Germans will be in Paris before very long. And more than that, Susan Baker, they will be in Canada. Not in this part of it. The Huns shall never set foot in Prince Edward Island as long as I can handle a pitchfork, declared Susan, looking and feeling quite equal to routing the entire German army single-handed. No, Sophia Crawford, to tell you the plain truth, I am sick and tired of your gloomy predictions. I do not deny that some mistakes have been made. The Germans would never have got back Passchendaele if the Canadians had been left there, and it was a bad business trusting to those Portuguese at the Lys River. But that is no reason why you or anyone should go about proclaiming the war is lost. I do not want to quarrel with you, least of all at such a time as this, but our morale must be kept up, and I am going to speak my mind out plainly, and tell you that if you cannot keep from such croaking, your room is better than your company. Cousin Sophia marched home in high dudgeon to digest her affront, and did not reappear in Susan's kitchen for many weeks. Perhaps it was just as well, for they were hard weeks, when the Germans continued to strike, now here, now there, and seemingly vital points fell to them at every blow. And one day, in early May, when wind and sunshine frolicked to Rainbow Valley, and the maple grove was golden green, and the harbor all blue and dimpled and white-capped, the news came about Jem. There had been a trench raid on the Canadian front, a little trench raid so insignificant that it was never even mentioned in the dispatches. And when it was over, Lieutenant James Blythe was reported wounded and missing. 
I think this is even worse than the news of his death would have been, moaned Rilla through her white lips that night. No, no. Missing leaves a little hope, Rilla, urged Gertrude Oliver. Yes, torturing, agonized hope that keeps you from ever being quite resigned to the worst, said Rilla. Oh, Miss Oliver, must we go for weeks and months, not knowing whether Jem is alive or dead? Perhaps we will never know. I, I cannot bear it. I cannot. Walter, and now Jem. This will kill Mother. Look at her face, Miss Oliver, and you'll see that. And Faith, poor Faith, how can she bear it? Gertrude shivered with pain. She looked up at the pictures hanging over Rilla's desk and felt a sudden hatred of Mona Lisa's endless smile. Will not even this blot it off your face? She thought savagely, but she said gently, No. It won't kill your mother. She's made of finer metal than that. Besides, she refuses to believe Jem is dead. She will cling to hope, and we must all do that. Faith, you may be sure, will do it. I cannot, moaned Rilla. Jem was wounded. What chance would he have? Even if the Germans found him, we know how they've treated wounded prisoners. I wish I could hope, Miss Oliver. It would help, I suppose. But hope seems dead in me. I can't hope without some reason for it, and there's no reason. When Miss Oliver had gone to her own room, and Rilla was lying on her bed in the moonlight, praying desperately for a little strength, Susan stepped in like a gaunt shadow and sat down beside her. Rilla, dear, do not you worry. Little Jem is not dead. Oh, how can you believe that, Susan? Because I know. Listen you to me. When that word came this morning, the first thing I thought of was Dog Monday. And tonight, as soon as I got the supper dishes washed and the bread set, I went down to the station. There was Dog Monday, waiting for the train, just as patient as usual. Now, Rilla, dear, that trench raid was four days ago, last Monday, and I said to the station agent, can you tell me if that dog howled or made any kind of a fuss last Monday night? He thought it over a bit, and then he said, No, he did not. Are you sure? I said, There's more depends on it than you think. Dead sure, he said. I was up all night last Monday night because my mare was sick, and there was never a sound out of him. I would have heard if there had been, for the stable door was open all the time, and his kennel is right across from it. Now, Rilla, dear, those were the man's very words, and you know how that poor dog howled all night after the battle of Corselet. Yet he did not love Walter as much as he loved Jem. If he mourned for Walter like that, do you suppose he would sleep sound in his kennel the night after Jem had been killed? No, Rilla dear, little Jem is not dead, and that you may tie to. If he were, Dog Monday would have known, just as he knew before, and he would not still be waiting for the trains. It was absurd, and irrational, and impossible. But Rilla believed it, for all that, and Mrs. Blythe believed it. And the doctor, though he smiled faintly and pretended derision, felt an odd confidence replace his first despair. And foolish and absurd or not, they all plucked up heart and courage to carry on, just because a faithful little dog at the Glen Station was still watching with unbroken faith for his master to come home. Common sense might scorn, incredulity might mutter mere superstition, but in their hearts the folk of Ingleside stood by their belief that Dog Monday knew. End of chapter 29
Borden's time. Susan got up and went to bed by God's time, and regulated her own goings and comings by it. She served the meals, under protest, by Borden's time, and she had to go to church by it, which was the crowning injury. But she said her prayers by her own clock, and fed the hens by it, so that there was always a furtive triumph in her eye when she looked at the doctor. She had got the better of him by so much at least. "'Whiskers on the moon is very much delighted with this daylight-saving business,' she told him one evening. "'Of course, he naturally would be, since I understand that the Germans invented it. I hear he came near to losing his entire wheat crop lately. Warren Mead's cows broke into the field one day last week. It was the very day the Germans captured Chemang de Dam, which may have been a coincidence or may not, and were making fine havoc of it when Mrs. Dick Clough happened to see them from her attic window.' at first she had no intention of letting mr pryor know she told me she had just gloated over the sight of those cows pasturing on his wheat she felt it served him exactly right but presently she reflected that the wheat crop was a matter of great importance and that save and serve meant that those cows must be routed out as much as it meant anything so she went down and phoned over to whiskers about the matter all the thanks she got was that he said something queer right out to her she is not prepared to state that it was actually swearing for you cannot be sure just what you hear over the phone but she has her own opinion and so have i but i will not express it for here comes mr meredith and whiskers is one of his elders so we must be discreet are you looking for the new star asked mr meredith joining miss oliver and rilla who were standing among the blossoming potatoes gazing skyward yes we have found it see it is just above the tip of the tallest old pine it's wonderful to be looking at something that happened three thousand years ago isn't it said rilla that is when astronomers think the collision took place which produced this new star it makes me feel horribly insignificant she added under her breath even this event cannot dwarf into what may be the proper perspective in star systems the fact that the germans are again only one leap from paris said gertrude restlessly i think i would like to have been an astronomer said mr meredith dreamily gazing at the star there must be a strange pleasure in it agreed miss oliver an unearthly pleasure in more senses than one i would like to have a few astronomers for my friends fancy talking the gossip of the hosts of heaven laughed rilla i wonder if astronomers feel a very deep interest in earthly affairs said the doctor Perhaps students of the canals of Mars would not be so keenly sensitive to the significance of a few yards of trenches lost or won on the western front. I have read somewhere, said Mr. Meredith, that Ernest Renan wrote one of his books during the siege of Paris in 1870 and enjoyed the writing of it very much. I suppose one would call him a philosopher. I have read also, said Miss Oliver, that shortly before his death he said that his only regret in dying was that he must die before he had seen what that extremely interesting young man, the German Emperor, would do in his life. If Ernest Renan walked today and saw what that interesting young man had done to his beloved France, not to speak of the world, I wonder if his mental detachment would be as complete as it was in 1870. I wonder where Jem is tonight, thought Rilla in a sudden bitter inrush of remembrance. It was over a month since the news had come about Jem. Nothing had been discovered concerning him in spite of all efforts. Two or three letters had come from him, written before the trench raid, and since then there had been only unbroken silence. Now the Germans were again at the Marne, pressing nearer and nearer Paris. Now rumors were coming of another Austrian offensive against the Piave line. Rilla turned away from the new star sick at heart it was one of the moments when hope and courage failed her utterly when it seemed impossible to go on even one more day if only they knew what had happened to jem you can face anything you know but a beleaguerment of fear and doubt and suspense is a hard thing for the morale surely if jem were alive some word would have come through he must be dead only they would never know they could never be quite sure. And Dog Monday would wait for the train until he died of old age. Monday was only a poor, faithful, rheumatic little dog who knew nothing more of his master's fate than they did. 
Rilla had a white night and did not fall asleep until late. When she wakened, Gertrude Oliver was sitting at her window, leaning out to meet the silver mystery of the dawn. Her clever, striking profile, with the masses of black hair behind it, came out clearly against the pallid gold of the eastern sky. Rilla remembered Jem's admiration of the curve of Miss Oliver's brow and chin, and she shuddered. Everything that reminded her of Jem was beginning to give intolerable pain. Walter's death had inflicted on her heart a terrible wound, but it had been a clean wound and had healed slowly, as such wounds do, though the scar must remain there forever. But the torture of Jem's disappearance was another thing. There was a poison in it that kept it from healing. The alternations of hope and despair, the endless watching each day for the letter that never came, that might never come, the newspaper tales of ill usage of prisoners, the bitter wonder as to Jem's wound, all were increasingly hard to bear. Gertrude Oliver turned her head. There was not brilliancy in her eyes. Rilla, I've had another dream. Oh, no, no, cried Rilla, shrinking. Miss Oliver's dreams had always foretold coming disaster. Rilla, it was a good dream. Listen, I dreamed just as I did four years ago, that I stood on the veranda steps and looked down the glen, and it was still covered by waves that lapped about my feet. But as I looked, the waves began to ebb, and they ebbed as swiftly as, four years ago, they rolled in, ebbed out and out to the gulf, and the glen lay before me, beautiful and green, with a rainbow-spanning rainbow valley, a rainbow of such splendid colour that it dazzled me, and I woke Rilla, Rilla Blythe, the tide has turned. I wish I could believe it, sighed Rilla. Sooth was my prophecy of fair. Believe it when it august chair, quoted Gertrude almost gaily. I tell you I have no doubt. Yet in spite of the great Italian victory at the Piave that came a few days later, she had doubt many a time in the hard month that followed, and when in mid-July the Germans crossed the Marne again, despair came sickeningly. It was idle, they all felt, to hope that the miracle of the Marne would be repeated. But it was. Again, as in 1914, the tide turned at the Marne. The French and the American troops struck their sudden smashing blow on the exposed flank of the enemy, and, with the almost inconceivable rapidity of a dream, the whole aspect of the war changed. The Allies have won two tremendous victories, said the doctor on 20th July. It's the beginning of the end. I feel it. I feel it, said Mrs. Blythe. Thank God, said Susan, folding her trembling old hands. Then she added, under her breath, But it won't bring our boys back. Nevertheless, she went out and ran up the flag, for the first time since the fall of Jerusalem. As it caught the breeze and swelled gallantly out above her, Susan lifted her hand and saluted it, as she had seen Shirley do. We've all given something to keep you flying, she said. Four hundred thousand of our boys gone overseas, fifty thousand of them killed. But you are worth it. The wind whipped her grey hair about her face, and the gingham apron that shattered her from head to foot was cut on lines of economy, not of grace. Yet somehow, just then, Susan made an imposing figure. She was one of the women, courageous, unquailing, patient, heroic, who had made victory possible. In her, they all saluted the symbol for which their dearest had fought. Something of this was in the doctor's mind as he watched her from the door. Susan, he said, when she turned to come in, from first to last of this business, you have been a brick. End of chapter 30、chapter、thirty one of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one Mrs. Matilda Pittman. Rilla and Jims were standing on the rear platform of their car when the train stopped at the little Millward siding. The August evening was so hot and close that the crowded cars were stifling. Nobody ever knew just why trains stopped at Millward siding. Nobody was ever known to get off there or get on. There was only one house nearer to it than four miles, and it was surrounded by acres of blueberry barrens and scrub spruce trees. Rilla was on her way into Charlottetown to spend the night with a friend, and the next day in Red Cross shopping. 
she had taken james with her partly because she did not want susan or her mother to be bothered with his care partly because of a hungry desire in her heart to have as much of him as she could before she might have to give him up for ever james anderson had written to her not long before this he was wounded and in the hospital he would not be able to go back to the front and as soon as he was able he would be coming home for jim's rilla was heavy-hearted over this and worried also she loved jim's dearly and would feel deeply giving him up in any case but if jim anderson were a different sort of man with a proper home for the child it would not be so bad but to give jim's up to a roving shiftless irresponsible father however kind and good-hearted he might be and she knew jim anderson was kind and good-hearted enough was a bitter prospect to rilla it was not even likely anderson would stay in the glen he had no ties there now he might even go back to england she might never see her dear sunshine and carefully brought up little jims again with such a father what might his fate be rilla meant to beg jim anderson to leave him with her but from his letter she had not much hope that he would if he would only stay in the glen where i could keep an eye on jims and have him often with me i wouldn't feel so worried about it she reflected but i feel sure he won't and jims will never have any chance and he's such a bright little chap he has ambition wherever he got it and he isn't lazy but his father will never have a cent to give him any education or start in life jims my little war baby whatever's going to become of you jims was not in the least concerned over what was to become of him he was gleefully watching the antics of a striped chipmunk that was frisking over the roof of the little siding as the train pulled out jims leaned eagerly forward for a last look at chippy pulling his hand from rilla's rilla was so engrossed in wondering what was to become of jims in the future that she forgot to take notice of what was happening to him in the present what did happen was that jims lost his balance shot headlong down the steps hurtled across the little siding platform and landed in a clump of bracken fern on the other side Rilla shrieked and lost her head. She sprang down the steps and jumped off the train. Fortunately, the train was still going at a comparatively slow speed. Fortunately, also, Rilla retained enough sense to jump the way it was going. Nevertheless, she fell and sprawled helplessly down the embankment, landing in a ditch full of a rank growth of goldenrod and fireweed. Nobody had seen what had happened, and the train whisked briskly away around a curve in the barrens. Rilla picked herself up, dizzy but unhurt, scrambled out of the ditch and flew wildly across the platform, expecting to find Jims dead or broken in pieces. But Jims, except for a few bruises and a big fright, was quite uninjured. He was so badly scared that he didn't even cry. But Rilla, when she found that he was safe and sound, burst into tears and sobbed wildly. "'Nasty old twain,' remarked Jims in disgust. "'A nasty old god,' he added with a scowl at the heavens. A laugh broke into Rilla's sobbings, producing something very like what her father would have called hysterics. But she caught herself before the hysteria could conquer her. "'Rilla Blythe, I'm ashamed of you. Pull yourself together immediately. Jims, you shouldn't have said anything like that.' "'God threw me off the train,' declared Jims defiantly. "'Somebody threw me. You didn't fool me, so it was God.' "'No, it wasn't. You fell because you let go of my hand and bent too far forward.' I told you not to do that, so it was your own fault. Jims looked to see if she meant it, then glanced up at the sky again. Excuse me, then, God, he remarked airily. Rilla scanned the sky also. She did not like its appearance. A heavy thundercloud was appearing in the northwest. What in the world was to be done? There was no other train that night, since the nine o'clock special ran only on Saturdays. Would it be possible for them to reach Hannah Brewster's house, two miles away before the storm broke? Rilla thought she could do it alone easily enough, but with Jim's it was another matter. Were his little legs good for it? "'We've got to try it,' said Rilla desperately. "'We might stay in the siding until the thunderstorm's over, but it may keep on raining all night, and anyway it will be pitch dark. If we can get to Hannah's she will keep us all night.' Hannah Brewster, when she had been Hannah Crawford, had lived in the Glen and gone to school with Rilla. They had been good friends then, though Hannah had been three years the older. She had married very young, and had gone to live in Millward. What with hard work and babies and a ne'er-do-well husband, her life had not been an easy one, and Hannah seldom revisited her old home. Rilla had visited her once after her marriage, but had not seen her or even heard of her for many years. She knew, however, that she and James would find welcome and harborage in any house where rosy-faced, open-hearted, generous Hannah lived. 
for the first mile they got on very well, but the second one was harder. The road, seldom used, was rough and deep-rutted. Jims grew so tired that Rilla had to carry him for the last quarter. She reached the Brewster house, almost exhausted, and dropped Jims on the walk with a sigh of thankfulness. The sky was black with clouds, the first heavy drops were beginning to fall, and the rumble of thunder was growing very loud. Then she made an unpleasant discovery. The blinds were all down and the doors locked. Evidently the Brewsters were not at home. Rilla ran to the little barn. It, too, was locked. No other refuge presented itself. The bare, whitewashed little house had not even a veranda or porch. It was almost dark now, and her plight seemed desperate. "'I'm going to get in if I have to break a window,' said Rilla resolutely. "'Hannah would want me to do that. She'd never get over it if she heard I came to her house for refuge in a thunderstorm and couldn't get in.' Luckily, she did not have to go to the length of actual housebreaking. The kitchen window went up quite easily. Rilla lifted Jims in and scrambled through herself, just as the storm broke in good earnest. "'Oh, see all the little pieces of thunder!' cried Jims in delight as the hail danced in after them. Rilla shut the window and with some difficulty found and lighted a lamp. They were in a very snug little kitchen. Opening off it in one side was a trim, nicely furnished parlour, and on the other a pantry, which proved to be well stocked. "'I'm going to make myself at home,' said Rilla. "'I know that is just what Hannah would want me to do. I'll get a little snack for Jims and me, and then if the rain continues and nobody comes home I'll just go upstairs to the spare room and go to bed. There's nothing like acting sensibly in an emergency. If I'd not been a goose when I saw Jims fall off the train I'd have rushed back into the car and got someone to stop it. Then I wouldn't be in this scrape. Since I'm in it I'll make the best of it. This house,' she added, looking around, is fixed up much nicer than when I was here before. Of course Hannah and Ted were just beginning housekeeping then. But somehow I've had the idea that Ted hasn't been very prosperous. He must have done better than I've been led to believe when they can afford furniture like this. I'm awfully glad for Hannah's sake. The thunderstorm passed, but the rain continued to fall heavily. At eleven o'clock Rilla decided that nobody was coming home. Jims had fallen asleep on the sofa. She carried him up to the spare room and put him to bed. Then she undressed, put on a nightgown she found in the washstand drawer, and scrambled sleepily in between very nice lavender-scented sheets. She was so tired after her adventures and exertions that not even the oddity of her situation could keep her awake. She was sound asleep in a few minutes. Rilla slept until eight o'clock the next morning, and then wakened with startling suddenness. Somebody was saying in a harsh, gruff voice, "'Hey, you two, wake up. I want to know what this means.' Rilla did wake up, promptly and effectually. She had never in all her life wakened up so thoroughly before. Standing in the room were three people, one of them a man, who were absolute strangers to her. The man was a big fellow with a bushy black beard and an angry scowl. Beside him was a woman, a tall, thin, angular person with violently red hair and an indescribable hat. She looked even crosser and more amazed than the man, if that were possible. In the background was another woman, a tiny old lady who must have been at least eighty. She was, in spite of her tininess, a very striking-looking personage. She was dressed in unrelieved black, had snow-white hair, a dead-white face, and snapping, vivid, coal-black eyes. She looked as amazed as the other two, but Rilla realized that she didn't look cross. Rilla also was realizing that something was wrong, fearfully wrong. Then the man said, more gruffly than other, "'Come now, who are you, and what business have you here?' Rilla raised herself on one elbow looking and feeling, hopelessly, bewildered and foolish. She heard the old black-and-white lady in the background chuckle to herself. She must be real, Rilla thought. I can't be dreaming her. Aloud she gasped. Isn't this Theodore Brewster's place? No, said the big woman, speaking for the first time. This place belongs to us. We bought it from the Brewsters last fall. They moved to Greenvale. Our name is Chapley. Poor Rilla fell back on her pillow, quite overcome. "'Oh, I beg your pardon,' she said. I, "'I thought the Brewsters lived here. Mrs. Brewster's a friend of mine. I'm Rilla Blythe, Dr. Blythe's daughter from Glen St. Mary. I I was going to town with my—my—this my, uh, this little boy, and he fell off the train, and I jumped off after him, and nobody knew of it. I knew we couldn't get home last night, and a storm was coming up. So we came here, and when we found nobody at home, we—' 
well, we, uh, just got in through the window and, and made ourselves at home. So it seems, said the woman sarcastically. A likely story, said the man. We weren't born yesterday, added the woman. Madame Black and White didn't say anything, but when the other two made their pretty speeches, she doubled up in a silent convulsion of mirth, shaking her head from side to side and beating the air with her hands. Rilla, stung by the disagreeable attitude of the Chapleys, regained her self-possession and lost her temper. She sat up in bed and said in her haughtiest voice, "'I do not know when you were born or where, but it must have been somewhere where very peculiar manners were taught. If you will have the decency to leave my room, er, this room, until I can get up and dress, I shall not transgress upon your hospitality.' Rilla was killingly sarcastic. "'Any longer.' and I shall pay you amply for the food we have eaten and the night's lodging I have taken. The black and white apparition went through the motion of clapping her hands, but not a sound did she make. Perhaps Mr. Chapley was cowed by Rilla's tone, or perhaps he was appeased at the prospect of payment. At all events, he spoke more civilly. Well, that's fair. If you pay up, it's all right. She shall do no such thing as pay you said Madame Black and White in a surprisingly clear, resolute, authoritative tone of voice. If you haven't got any shame for yourself, Robert Chapley, you've got a mother-in-law who can be ashamed for you. No stranger shall be charged for room and lodging in any house where Mrs. Matilda Pittman lives. Remember that. Though I may have come down in the world, I haven't quite forgot all decency for all that. I knew you was a skin plant when Amelia married you, and you've made her as bad as yourself. But Mrs. Matilda Pittman has been boss for a long time, and Mrs. Matilda Pittman will remain boss. Here you, Robert Chapley, take yourself out of here and let that girl get dressed. And you, Amelia, go downstairs and cook a breakfast for her. Never in all her life had Rilla seen anything like the abject meekness with which those two big people obeyed that might. They went without a word or look of protest. As the door closed behind them, Mrs. Matilda Pittman laughed silently and rocked from side to side in her merriment. "'Ain't it funny?' she said. "'I mostly lets them run the length of their tether, but sometimes I has to pull them up, and then I does it with a jerk. They don't dast to aggravate me, because I've got considerable hard cash, and they're afraid I won't leave it all to them. Neither I will. I'll leave them some, but some I won't.' just to vex em. I haven't made up my mind where I will leave it, but I'll have to soon, for at eighty a body is living on borrowed time. Now, you can take your time about dressing, my dear, and I'll go downstairs to keep them mean scalawags in order. That's a handsome child you have there. Is he your brother? No, he's a little war baby I've been taking care of, because his mother died and his father was overseas, answered Rilla in a subdued tone. War baby! Huh! Well, I'd better skin out before he wakes up or will likely start crying. Children don't like me. Never did. I can't recollect any youngster ever coming near me of his own accord. Never had any of my own. Amelia was my stepdaughter. Well, it seems me a world of bother. If kids don't like me, I don't like them. So that's an even score. But that certainly is a handsome child. Jim's chose this moment for waking up. He opened his big brown eyes and looked at Mrs. Matilda Pittman unblinkingly. Then he sat up, dimpled deliciously, pointed to her, and said solemnly to Rilla, Pretty lady, Rilla, pretty lady. Mrs. Matilda Pittman smiled. Even eighty odd is sometimes vulnerable in vanity. I've heard that children and fools tell the truth, she said. I was used to compliments when I was young, but they're scarcer when you get as far along as I am. I haven't had one for years. It tastes good. I suppose now, you monkey, you want to give me a kiss? Then Jims did a quite surprising thing. He was not a demonstrative youngster, and was cheery with kisses, even to the Ingleside people. But without a word he stood up in bed, his plump little body encased only in his undershirt, ran to the footboard, flung his arms around Mrs. Matilda Pittman's neck, and gave her a bear hug, accompanied by three or four hearty, ungrudging smacks. Jims! protested Rilla, gasped at this liberty. You leave him be ordered Mrs. Matilda Pittman, setting her bonnet straight. Was I like to see someone that isn't scared of me. Everybody is. You are, though you're trying to hide it. And why? Of course Robert and Amelia are because they make them scared on purpose. 
but folks always are, no matter how civil I be to them. Are you going to keep this child? I'm afraid not. His father's coming home before long. Is he any good? The father, I mean. Well, he's kind and nice, but he's poor, and I'm afraid he always will be, faltered Rilla. I see. Shiftless. Can't make her keep. Well, I'll see, I'll see. I have an idea. It's a good idea. And besides, it will make Robert and Amelia squirm. That's its main merit in my eyes. Though I like that child, mind you, because he ain't scared of me. He's worth the bother. Now, you get dressed, as I said before, and come down when you're good and ready. Rilla was stiff and sore after her tumble and walk of the night before, but she was not long in dressing herself and Jim's. When she went down to the kitchen, she found a smoking hot breakfast on the table. Mr. Chapley was nowhere in sight, and Mrs. Chapley was cutting bread with a sulky air. Mrs. Matilda Pittman was sitting in an armchair, knitting a grey army sock. She still wore her bonnet and her triumphant expression. "'Set right in, dears, and make a good breakfast,' she said. "'I'm not hungry,' said Rilla, almost pleadingly. "'I don't think I can eat anything. And it's time I was starting for the station. The morning train will soon be along. Please excuse me and let us go. I'll take a piece of bread and butter for Jim's.' Mrs. Matilda Pittman shook a knitting needle playfully at Rilla. "'Sit down and take your breakfast,' she said. "'Mrs. Matilda Pittman commands you. "'Everybody obeys Mrs. Matilda Pittman, even Robert and Amelia. "'You must obey her, too.' "'Rilla did obey her. "'She sat down, and such was the influence of Mrs. Matilda Pittman's mesmeric eye. "'She ate a tolerable breakfast. "'The obedient Amelia never spoke. "'Mrs. Matilda Pittman did not speak either, but she knitted furiously and chuckled.' When Rilla had finished, Mrs. Matilda Pittman rolled up her sock. "'Now you can go if you want to,' she said. "'But you don't have to go. You can stay here as long as you want to, and don't make Amelia cook your meals for you.' The independent Miss Blythe, whom a certain clique of junior Red Cross girls accused of being domineering and bossy, was thoroughly cowed. "'Thank you,' she said meekly. "'But we really must go.' "'Well, then,' said Mrs. Matilda Pittman, throwing open the door. "'Your conveyance is ready for you.' I told Robert he must hitch up and drive you to the station. I enjoy making Robert do things. It's almost the only sport I have left. I'm over eighty, and most things have lost their flavor except Boss and Robert. Robert sat before the door on the front seat of a trim, double-seated, rubber-tired buggy. He must have heard every word his mother-in-law said, but he gave no sign. I do wish, said Rilla, plucking up what little spirit she had left, that you would let me— Oh, ah— uh. Then she quailed again before Mrs. Matilda Pittman's eye. Recompense you for, for... Mrs. Matilda Pittman said before, and meant it, that she doesn't take pay for entertaining strangers, nor let other people where she lives do it, much as their natural meanness would like to do it. You go along to town, and don't forget to call the next time you come this way. Don't be scared. Not that you are scared of much, I reckon, considering the way you sassed Robert back this morning. I like your spunk. Most girls nowadays are such timid, scary creatures. When I was a girl, I wasn't afraid of nothing nor nobody. Mind you, take good care of that boy. He ain't any common child. And make Robert drop round all the puddles in the road. I won't have that new buggy splashed. As they drove away, Jims threw kisses at Mrs. Matilda Pittman, as long as he could see her. And Mrs. Matilda Pittman waved her sock back at him. Robert spoke no word, either good or bad, all the way to the station, but he remembered the puddles. When Rilla got out at the siding, she thanked him courteously. The only response she got was a grunt, as Robert turned his horse and started for home. Well, Rilla drew a long breath. I must try to get back into Rilla Blythe again. I've been somebody else these past few hours. I don't know just who. Some creation of that extraordinarily old person's. I believe she hypnotized me. What an adventure this will be to write to the boys. And then she sighed. Bitter remembrance came that there was only Jerry, Ken, Carl, and Shirley to write it to now. Jem, who would have appreciated Mrs. Matilda Pittman keenly. Where was Jem? End of chapter 31「Chapter 32 of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32. Word from Jem. 4th August, 1918. 
It is four years tonight since the dance at the lighthouse. Four years of war. It seems like three times four. I was fifteen then. I am nineteen now. I expected that these past four years would be the most delightful years of my life, and they have been years of war, years of fear and grief and worry, but, I humbly hope, of a little growth in strength and character as well. Today I was going through the hall and I heard Mother saying something to Father about me. I didn't mean to listen. I couldn't help hearing her as I went along the hall and upstairs, so perhaps that's why I heard what listeners are said never to hear something good of myself. And because it was Mother who said it, I'm going to write it here in my journal, for my comforting when days of discouragement come upon me, in which I feel that I'm vain and selfish and weak and that there's no good thing in me. Rilla has developed in a wonderful fashion these past four years. She used to be such an irresponsible young creature. She has changed into a capable, womanly girl, and she is such a comfort to me. Nan and I have grown a little away from me. They've been so little at home. But Rilla has grown closer and closer to me. We are chums. I don't see how I could have got through these terrible years without her, Gilbert. There, that is just what Mother said. And I feel glad, and sorry, and proud, and humble. It's beautiful to have my mother think that about me. But I don't deserve it quite. I'm not as good and strong as all that. There are heaps of times when I've felt cross and impatient and woeful and despairing. It's Mother and Susan who've been this family's backbone. But I've helped a little, I believe, and I'm so glad and thankful. The war news has been good right along. The French and Americans are pushing the Germans back and back and back. Sometimes I'm afraid it's too good to last. After nearly four years of disasters, one has a feeling that this constant success is unbelievable. We don't rejoice noisily over it. Susan keeps the flag up, but we go softly. The price paid has been too high for jubilation. We're just thankful that it has not been paid in vain. No word has come from Jem. We hope, because we dare not do anything else. But there are hours when we all feel, though we never say so, that such hoping is foolishness. These hours come more and more frequently as the weeks go by. And we may never know. That is the most terrible thought of all. I wonder how Faith is bearing it. To judge from her letters, she has never a moment given up hope, but she must have had her dark hours of doubt like the rest of us. 20th August, 1918 The Canadians have been in action again, and Mr. Meredith had a cable today, saying that Carl had been slightly wounded and is in the hospital. It did not say where the wound was, which is unusual, and we all feel worried. There's news of a fresh victory every day now. 30th August, 1918 The Merediths had a letter from Carl today. His wound was... Only a slight one. But it was in his right eye, and the slight is gone forever. One eye is enough to watch bugs with, Carl writes cheerfully. And we know it might have been oh so much worse, if it had been both eyes. But I cried all the afternoon after I saw Carl's letter. Those beautiful, fearless blue eyes of his. There is one comfort. He will not have to go back to the front. He is coming home as soon as he's out of the hospital, the first of our boys to return. When will the others come? There is one who will never come. At least we will not see him if he does. But, oh, I think he will be there. When our Canadian soldiers return, there will be a shadow army with them, the army of the fallen. We will not see them, but they will be there. 1st September, 1918 Mother and I went into Charlottetown yesterday to see the moving picture, Hearts of the World. I made an awful goose of myself. Father will never stop teasing me about it for the rest of my life. But it all seemed so horribly real, and I was so intensely interested that I forgot everything but the scenes I saw enacted before my eyes. And then, quite near the last, came a terribly exciting one. The heroine was struggling with a horrible German soldier who was trying to drag her away. I knew she had a knife. I'd seen her hide it to have it in readiness, and I couldn't understand why she didn't produce it and finish the brute. I thought she must have forgotten it, and just at the tensest moment of the scene I lost my head altogether. I just stood right up on my feet in that crowded house and shrieked at the top of my voice, "'The knife is in your stocking! The knife is in your stocking!' 
I created a sensation. The funny part was that just as I said it, the girl did snatch out the knife and stab the soldier with it. Everybody in the house laughed. I came to my senses and fell back in my seat, overcome with mortification. Mother was shaking with laughter. I could have shaken her. Why hadn't she pulled me down and choked me before I had made such an idiot of myself? She protests that there wasn't time. Fortunately, the house was dark, and I don't believe there was anybody there who knew me. And I thought I was becoming sensible and self-controlled and womanly. It is plain I have some distance to go yet before I attain that devoutly desired consummation. 20th September, 1918 in the east Bulgaria has asked for peace, and in the west the British have smashed the Hindenburg line, and right here in Glen St. Mary little Bruce Meredith has done something that I think wonderful, wonderful because of the love behind it. Mrs. Meredith was here tonight and told us about it, and Mother and I cried, and Susan got up and clattered the things about the stove. Bruce always loved Jem very devotedly, and the child has never forgotten him all these years. He's been as faithful in his way as Dog Monday was in his. We have always told him that Jem would come back. But it seems he was in Carter Flagg's store last night, and he heard his Uncle Norman flatly declaring that Jem Blythe would never come back, and that the Ingleside folk might as well give up hoping he would. Bruce went home and cried himself to sleep. This morning his mother saw him going out of the yard with a very sorrowful and determined look, carrying his pet kitten. She didn't think much more about it until later on he came in with the most tragic little face and told her, his little body shaking with sobs, that he had drowned Stripey. "'Why did you do that?' Mrs. Meredith exclaimed. "'To bring Jem back,' sobbed Bruce. "'I thought, if I sacrificed Stripey, God would send Jem back. So I drowned him. And, oh, mother, <laughs> it was awful hard.' But surely God will send Jem back now, because Stripey was the dearest thing I had. I just told God I would give him Stripey if he would send Jem back. And he will, won't he, Mother? Mrs. Meredith didn't know what to say to the poor child. She just could not tell him that perhaps his sacrifice wouldn't bring Jem back, that God didn't work that way. She told him that... He must inspect it right away, that perhaps... It would be quite a long time yet before Jem came back. But Bruce said... It oughtn't to take longer in a week, Mother. Oh, Mother, Stripey was such a nice little cat. He purred so pretty. Don't you think God ought to like him enough to let us have Jem? Mr. Meredith is worried about the effect on Bruce's faith in God, and Mrs. Meredith is worried about the effect on Bruce himself if his hope isn't fulfilled. And I feel as if I must cry every time I think of it. It was so splendid and sad and beautiful, the dear devoted little fellow. He worshipped that kitten. And if it all goes for nothing, as so many sacrifices seem to go for nothing, he will be broken-hearted. For he isn't old enough to understand that God doesn't answer our prayers just as we hope, and doesn't make bargains with us when we yield something we love up to him. 24th September, 1918 I've been kneeling at my window in the moonshine for a long time, just thanking God over and over again. The joy of last night and today has been so great that it seemed half pain, as if our hearts weren't big enough to hold it. Last night I was sitting here in my room at eleven o'clock writing a letter to Shirley. Everyone else was in bed except Father, who was out. I heard the telephone ring, and I ran out to the hall to answer it, before it should waken Mother. It was long distance calling, and when I answered it, said, This is the telegraph company's office in Charlottetown. There is an overseas cable for Dr. Blythe. I thought of Shirley. My heart stood still, and then I heard him saying, It's from Holland. The message was, Just arrived. Escaped from Germany. Quite well. Writing. James Blythe. I didn't faint, or fall, or scream. I didn't feel glad or surprised. I didn't feel anything. I felt numb, just as I did when I heard Walter had enlisted. I hung up the receiver and turned round. 
Mother was standing in her doorway. She wore her old rose kimono, and her hair was hanging down her back in a long, thick braid, and her eyes were shining. She looked just like a young girl. "'There is word from Jem,' she said. "'How did she know? I hadn't said a word at the phone except, yes, yes, yes!' She says she doesn't know how she knew, but she did know. She was awake, and she heard the ring, and she knew that there was word from Jem. "'He's alive. He's well. He's in Holland,' I said. Mother came out into the hall and said, "'I must get your father on the phone and tell him. He's in the upper glen.' She was very calm and quiet, not a bit like I would have expected her to be. But then I wasn't either. I went and woke up Gertrude and Susan and told them. Susan said, "'Thank God!' Firstly, and secondly, she said, "'Did I not tell you Dog Monday knew?' And thirdly, "'I'll go down and make a cup of tea.' And she stalked down in her nightdress to make it. She did make it, and made Mother and Gertrude drink it, but I went back to my room and shut my door and locked it. And I knelt by my window and cried, just as Gertrude did when her great news came. I think I know exactly what I shall feel like on the resurrection morning. 4th October, 1918 Today Jem's letter came. It has been in the house only six hours, and it is almost read to pieces. The postmistress told everybody in the glen it had come, and everybody came up to hear the news. Jem was badly wounded in the thigh, and he was picked up and taken to prison, so delirious with fever they didn't know what was happening to him or where he was. It was weeks before he came to his senses and was able to write. Then he did write, but it never came. He wasn't treated at all badly at his camp, only the food was poor. He had nothing to eat but a little black bread and boiled turnips and now and then a little soup with black peas in it. And we sat down every one of those days to three good, square, luxurious meals. He wrote us as often as he could, but he was afraid we were not getting his letters, because no reply came. As soon as he was strong enough, he tried to escape, but was caught and brought back. A month later he and a comrade made another attempt and succeeded in reaching Holland. Jem can't come home right away. He isn't quite so well as his cable said, for his wound has not healed properly, and he has to go into a hospital in England for further treatment. But he says he will be all right eventually, and we know he's safe and will be back home sometime. And oh, the difference it makes in everything! I had a letter from Jim Anderson today, too. He has married an English girl, got his discharge, and is coming right home to Canada with his bride. I don't know whether to be glad or sorry. It will depend on what kind of a woman she is. I had a second letter also of a somewhat mysterious tenor. It is from a Charlottetown lawyer, asking me to go in to see him at my earliest convenience, in regard to a certain matter connected with the estate of the late Mrs. Matilda Pitton. I read a notice of Mrs. Pittman's death from heart failure in the Enterprise a few weeks ago. I wonder if the summons has anything to do with Jim's. 5th October, 1918 I went into town this morning and had an interview with Mrs. Pittman's lawyer, a little thin, wispy man who spoke of his late client with such a re profound respect that it is evident that he was as much under her thumb as Robert and Amelia were. He drew up a new will for her a short time before her death. She was worth thirty thousand dollars, the bulk of which was left to Amelia Chapley. But she left five thousand to me in trust for Jim's. The interest is to be used as I see fit for his education, and the principal is to be paid over to him on his twentieth birthday. Certainly Jim's was born lucky. I saved him from slow extinction at the hands of Mrs. Conover. Mary Vance saved him from death by diphtheric croup. His star saved him when he fell off the train. And he tumbled not only into a clump of bracken, but right into this nice little legacy. Evidently, as Mrs. Matilda Pittman said, and as I have always believed, he's no common child, and he has no common destiny in store for him. At all events, he's provided for, and in such a fashion that Jim Anderson can't squander his inheritance if he wanted to. Now, if the new English stepmother is only a good sort, I shall feel quite easy about the future of my war baby. I wonder what Robert and Amelia will think of it. I fancy they will nail down their windows when they leave home after this. End of chapter 32
Chapter Thirty Three of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Three: Victory. A day of chilling winds and gloomy skies. Rilla quoted one Sunday afternoon, the sixth of October to be exact. It was so cold that they had lighted a fire in the living room, and the merry little flames were doing their best to counteract the outside dourness. It's more like November than October. November is such an ugly month. Cousin Sophia was there, having again forgiven Susan, and Mrs. Martin Clough, who was not visiting on Sunday, but had dropped in to borrow Susan's cure for rheumatism, that being cheaper than getting one from the doctor. I'm afeard we're going to have an early winter, foreboded Cousin Sophia. The muskrats are building awful big houses round the pond, and that's a sign that never fails. Dear me, how their child has grown. Cousin Sophia sighed again as if it were an unhappy circumstance that a child should grow. "'When do you expect his father?' "'Next week,' said Rilla. "'Well, I hope the stepmother won't abuse the poor child,' sighed Cousin Sophia. "'But I have my doubts. I have my doubts. Anyhow, he'll be sure to feel the difference between his usage here and what he'll get anywhere else. You've spoiled him so, Rilla, waiting on him hand and foot the way you've always done.' Rilla smiled and pressed her cheeks to Jim's curls. She knew sweet-tempered, sunny little Jim's was not spoiled. Nevertheless, her heart was anxious behind her smile. She, too, thought much about the new Mrs. Anderson and wondered uneasily what she would be like. "'I can't give Jim's up to a woman who won't love him,' she thought rebelliously. "'I believe it's going to rain,' said Cousin Sophia. "'We have had an awful lot of rain this fall already. It's going to make it awful hard for people to get their roots in.' It wasn't so in my young days. We generally had beautiful Octobers then. But the seasons is altogether different now from what they used to be. Clear across Cousin Sophia's doleful voice cut the telephone bell. Gertrude Oliver answered it. Yes? What? What? Is it true? Is it official? Thank you. Thank you. Gertrude turned and faced the room dramatically, her dark eyes flashing, her dark face flushed with feeling. All at once the sun broke through the thick clouds and poured through the big crimson maple outside the window. Its reflected glow enveloped her in a weird immaterial flame. She looked like a priestess performing some mystic, splendid rite. "'German and Austria are suing for peace,' she said. Rilla went crazy for a few minutes. She sprang up and danced around the room, clapping her hands, laughing, crying. "'Sit down, child,' said Mrs. Clow who never got excited over anything, and so had missed a tremendous amount of trouble and delight in her journey through life. Oh! cried Rilla. I have walked the floor for hours in despair and anxiety these past four years. Now let me walk it in joy. It was worth living long, dreary years for this minute, and it would be worth living them again just to look back to it. Susan, let's run up the flag, and we must phone the news to everyone in the Glen. "'Can we have as much sugar as we want to now?' asked Jims eagerly. It was a never-to-be-forgotten afternoon. As the news spread, excited people ran about the village and dashed up to Ingleside. The Meredith came over and stayed to supper, and everybody talked and nobody listened. Cousin Sophia tried to protest that "'Germany and Austria were not to be trusted, and it was all part of a plot.' But nobody paid the least attention to her. "'This Sunday,' makes up for that one in march said susan i wonder said gertrude dreamily apart to rilla if things won't seem rather flat and insipid when peace really comes after being fed for four years on horrors and fears terrible reverses amazing victories won't anything less be tame and uninteresting how strange and blessed and dullish will be not to dread the coming of the mail every day we must dread it for a little while yet i suppose said Rilla. Peace won't come, can't come, for some weeks yet. And in those weeks dreadful things may happen. My excitement is over. We have won the victory, but oh, what a price we have paid! Not too high a price for freedom, said Gertrude softly. Do you think it was, Rilla? No, said Rilla, under her breath. She was seeing a little white cross on a battlefield of France. No, not if those of us who live will show ourselves worthy of it. If we keep faith. We will keep faith, said Gertrude. She rose suddenly. 
A silence fell around the table, and in the silence Gertrude repeated Walter's famous poem, The Piper. When she finished, Mr. Mariner stood up and held up his glass. Let us drink, he said, to the silent army, to the boys who followed when the piper summoned. For our tomorrow they gave their today. Theirs is the victory. End of chapter 33《Chapter Thirty Four of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Four Mr. Hyde Goes to His Own Place, and Susan Takes a Honeymoon. Early in November, Jims left Ingleside. Rilla saw him go with many tears, but a heart free from boding. Mrs. Jim Anderson, number two, was such a nice little woman that one was rather inclined to wonder at the luck which bestowed her on Jim. She was rosy-faced and blue-eyed and wholesome, with the roundness and trickness of a geranium leaf. Rilla saw at first glance that she was to be trusted with Jims. "'I'm fond of children, miss,' she said heartily. "'I'm used to them. I've left six little brothers and sisters behind me. Jims is a dear child, and I must say you've done wonders in bringing him up so healthy and handsome. I'll be as good to him as if he was my own, miss, and I'll make Jim toe the line all right. He's a good worker.' All he needs is someone to keep him at it, and to take charge of his money. We've rented a little farm just out of the village, and we're going to settle down there. Jim wanted to stay in England, but I says no. I hate going to try a new country, and I've always thought Canada would suit me. I'm so glad you were going to live near us. You'll let Jim's come here often, won't you? I love him dearly. No doubt you do, miss, for a love of my child I never did see. We understand, Jim and me, what you've done for him, and you won't find us ungrateful. He can come here whenever you want him, and he'll always be glad of any advice from you about his bringing up. He is more your baby than anyone else's, I should say, and I'll see that you get your fair share of him, miss. So Jims went away, with the soup tureen, though not in it. Then the news of the armistice came, and even Glen St. Mary went mad. That night the village had a bonfire, and burned the Kaiser in effigy. The fishing village boys turned out and burned all the sand hills off in one grand, glorious conflagration that extended for seven miles. Up at Ingleside, Rilla ran laughing to her room. Now I'm going to do a most unladylike and inexcusable thing, she said as she pulled her green velvet hat out of its box. I'm going to kick this hat about the room until it is without form and void, and I shall never, as long as I live, wear anything of that shade of green again. You've certainly kept your vow pluckily, laughed Miss Oliver. It wasn't pluck, it was sheer obstinacy. I'm rather ashamed of it, said Rilla, kicking joyously. I wanted to show mother. It's mean to want to show your own mother, most unfilial conduct. But I have shown her. And I've shown myself a few things. Oh, Miss Oliver, just for one moment I'm really feeling quite young again. Young and frivolous and silly. Did I ever say November was an ugly month? Why, it's the most beautiful month in the whole year. Listen to the bells ringing in Rainbow Valley. I never heard them so clearly. They're ringing for peace and new happiness and all the dear, sweet, sane, homey things that we can have again now, Miss Oliver. Not that I'm sane just now. I don't pretend to be. The whole world is having a little crazy spell today. Soon we'll sober down and keep faith and begin to build up our new world. But just for today, let's be mad and glad. Susan came in from the outdoor sunlight, looking supremely satisfied. Mr. Hyde is gone, she announced. Gone? Do you mean he is dead, Susan? No, Mrs. Dr. dear, that beast is not dead. But you will never see him again. I feel sure of that. Don't be so mysterious, Susan. What has happened to him? Well, Mrs. Dr. dear, he was sitting out on the back steps this afternoon. It was just after the news came that the armistice had been signed, and he was looking his hidest. I can assure you he was an awesome-looking beast. All at once, Mrs. Dr. dear, Bruce Meredith came round the corner of the kitchen, walking on his stilts. He has been learning to walk on them lately, and came over to show me how well he could do it. Mr. Hyde just took a look, and one bound carried him over the yard fence. Then he went tearing through the maple grove, in great leaps, with his ears laid back. You never saw a creature so terrified, Mrs. Dr. dear. He has never returned. Oh, he'll come back, Susan, probably chastened in spirit by his fright. 
We will see, Mrs. Dr. dear. We will see. Remember, the armistice has been signed. And that reminds me that Whiskers on the Moon had a paralytic stroke last night. I am not saying it is a judgment on him, because I am not in the councils of the Almighty, but one can have one's own thoughts about it. Neither Whiskers on the Moon or Mr. Hyde will be much more heard of in Glen St. Mary, Mrs. Dr. dear, and that you may tie to. Mr. Hyde certainly was heard of no more. As it could hardly have been his fright that kept him away, the Ingleside folk decided that some dark fate of shot or poison had descended on him, except Susan, who believed and continued to affirm that he had merely gone to his own place. Rilla lamented him, for she had been very fond of her stately golden pussy, and had liked him quite as well in his weird hide moods as in his tame jekyll ones. And now, Mrs. Dr. dear, said Susan, since the fall house-cleaning is over and the garden truck is all safe in the cellar i am going to take a honeymoon to celebrate the peace a honeymoon susan yes mrs dr dear a honeymoon repeated susan firmly i shall never be able to get a husband but i am not going to be cheated out of everything and a honeymoon i intend to have i am going to charlottetown to visit my married brother and his family his wife has been ailing all the fall but nobody knows whether she is going to die or not she never did tell anyone what she was going to do until she did it that's the main reason why she was never liked in our family but to be on the safe side i feel that i should visit her i have not been in town for over a day for twenty years and i have a feeling that i might as well see one of those moving pictures there is so much talk of so as not to be wholly out of the swim but have no fear that i shall be carried away with them mrs dr dear i shall be away a fortnight if you can spare me so long you certainly deserve a good holiday susan better take a month that is the proper length for a honeymoon no mrs dr dear a fortnight is all i require besides i must be home for at least three weeks before christmas to make the proper preparations we will have a christmas that is a christmas this year mrs dr dear do you think there is any chance of our boys being home for it no, I think not, Susan. Both Jem and Shirley write that they don't expect to be home before spring. It may even be midsummer before Shirley comes. But Carl Meredith will be home, and Nan, and Di, and we will have a grand celebration once more. We'll set chairs for all, Susan, as you did our first war Christmas. Yes, for all. For my dear lad, whose chair must always be vacant, as well for the other, Susan. It is not likely I would forget to set his place, Mrs. Dr. dear said susan wiping her eyes as she departed to pack up for her honeymoon end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of rilla of ingleside by lucy maud montgomery this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five rilla my rilla carl meredith and miller douglas came home just before christmas and Glen St. Mary met them at the station with a brass band borrowed from Lowbridge and speeches of home manufacture. Miller was brisk and beaming, in spite of his wooden leg. He had developed into a broad-shouldered, imposing-looking fellow, and the D.C. medal he wore reconciled Miss Cornelia to the shortcomings of his pedigree, to such a degree that she tacitly recognized his engagement to Mary. The latter put on a few airs, especially when Carter Flagg took Miller into his store as head clerk but nobody grudged them to her. Of course, farming's out of the question for us now, she told Rilla. But Miller thinks he'll like storekeeping fine once he gets used to a quiet life again. And Carter Flagg will be a more agreeable boss than old Kitty. We're going to be married in the fall and live in the old mead house with the bay windows and the mansard roof. I've always thought that the handsomest house in the Glen, but never did I dream I'd ever live there. We're only renting it, of course, but if things go as we expect, and Carter Flagg takes Miller into partnership, we'll own it some day. Say, I've got on some in society, haven't I, considering what I came from? I never aspired to being a storekeeper's wife, but Miller's real ambitious, and he'll have a wife that'll back him up. He says he never saw a French girl worth looking at twice and that his heart beat true to me every moment he was away. Jerry Meredith and Joe Milgrave came back in January, and all winter the boys from the Glen and its environs came home by twos and threes. None of them came back just as they went away, not even those who had been so fortunate as to escape injury. 
one spring day when the daffodils were blowing on the ingleside lawn and the banks of the brook and rainbow valley were sweet with white and purple violets the little lazy afternoon accommodation train pulled into the glen station it was very seldom that passengers for the glen came by that train so nobody was there to meet it except the new station agent and a small black and yellow dog who for four and a half years had met every train that steamed into glen st mary thousands of trains had dog monday met and never had the boy he waited and watched for returned yet still dog monday watched on with eyes that never quite lost hope perhaps his dog heart failed him at times he was growing old and rheumatic when he walked back to his kennel after each train had gone his gait was very sober now he never trotted but went slowly with a drooping head and a depressed tail that had quite lost his saucy uplift one passenger stepped off the train a tall fellow in a faded lieutenant's uniform who walked with a barely perceptible limp he had a bronzed face and there were some gray hairs in the ruddy curls that clustered around his forehead the new station agent looked at him anxiously he was used to seeing the khaki-clad figures come off the train some met by a tumultuous crowd others who had sent no word of their coming stepping off quietly like this one but there was a certain distinction of bearing and features in this soldier that caught his attention and made him wonder a little more interestedly who he was a black and yellow streak shot past the station agent dog monday stiff dog monday rheumatic dog monday old never believe it dog monday was a young pup gone clean mad with rejuvenating joy he flung himself against the tall soldier with a bark that choked in his throat from sheer rapture he flung himself on the ground and writhed in a frenzy of welcome he tried to climb the soldier's khaki legs and slipped down and growled in an ecstasy that seemed as if it must tear his little body in pieces he licked his boots and when the lieutenant had with laughter on his lips and tears in his eyes succeeded in gathering the little creature up in his arms dog monday laid his head on the khaki shoulder and licked the sunburned neck making queer sounds between barks and sobs the station agent had heard the story of dog monday he knew now who the returned soldier was. Dog Monday's long vigil was ended. Jem Blythe had come home. We are all very happy and sad and thankful, wrote Rilla in her diary a week later. Though Susan has not yet recovered, never will recover, I believe, from the shock of having Jem come home the very night she had, owing to a strenuous day, prepared a pick-up supper. I shall never forget the sight of her, tearing madly about from pantry to cellar, hunting out stored away goodies. Just as if everybody cared what was on the table. None of us could eat anyway. It was meat and drink just to look at Jem. Mother seemed afraid to take her eyes off him lest he vanish out of her sight. It is wonderful to have Jem back. And little dog Monday. Monday refuses to be separated from Jem for a moment. He sleeps on the foot of his bed and squats beside him at mealtimes. And on Sunday he went into church with him and insisted on going right into our pew, where he went to sleep on Jem's feet. In the middle of the sermon he woke up and seemed to think he must welcome Jem all over again, for he bounded up with a series of barks and went quiet down until Jem took him up in his arms. But nobody seemed to mind. Mr. Meredith came and patted his head after the service and said, Faith and affection and loyalty are precious things wherever they are found. That little dog's love is a treasure, Jem. One night when Jem and I were talking things over in Rainbow Valley, I asked him if he had ever felt afraid at the front. Jem laughed. Afraid? I was afraid scores of times. Sick with fear. I, who used to laugh at Walter when he was frightened. Do you know, Walter was never frightened after he got to the front. Realities never scared him. Only his imagination could do that. His colonel told me that Walter was the bravest man in the regiment. Rilla, I never realised that Walter was dead until I came back home. You don't know how I miss him now. You folks here have got used to it in a sense, but it's all fresh to me. Walter and I grew up together. We were chums as well as brothers. And now here, in this old valley we loved when we were children, it has come home to me that I'm not going to see him again. Jem is going back to college in the fall, and so are Jerry and Carl. I suppose Shirley will, too. He expects to be home in July. Nan and Di will go on teaching. Faith doesn't expect to be home before September. 
I suppose she will teach then, too, for she and Jem can't be married until he gets through his course in medicine. Una Meredith has decided, I think, to take a course in household science at Kingsport, and Gertrude is to be married to her major and is frankly happy about it. Shamelessly happy, she says, but I think her attitude is very beautiful. They are all talking of their plans and hopes, more soberly than they used to do long ago, but still with interest, and a determination to carry on and make good in spite of lost years. We're in a new world, Jem says, and we've got to make this a better one than the old. That isn't done yet, though some folks seem to think it ought to be. The job isn't finished, it isn't really begun. The old world is destroyed, and we must build up the new one. It will be the task of years. I've seen enough of war to realise that we've got to make a world where wars can't happen. We've given Prussianism its mortal wound, but it isn't dead yet. And it isn't confined to Germany either. It isn't enough to drive out the old spirit. We've got to bring in the new. I'm writing down those words of gems in my diary so that I can read them over occasionally and get courage from them, when moods come when I find it not so easy to keep faith. Rilla closed her journal with a little sigh. Just then she was not finding it easy to keep faith. All the rest seemed to have some special aim or ambition about which to build up their lives. She had none. And she was very lonely, horribly lonely. Jem had come back, but he was not the laughing boy brother who had gone away in 1914, and he belonged to Faith. Walter would never come back. She had not even Jim's left. All at once her world seemed wide and empty. That it had seemed wide and empty from the moment yesterday, when she had read in a Montreal paper a fortnight-old list of returned soldiers in which was the name of Captain Kenneth Ford. So Ken was home, and he had not even written her that he was coming. He had been in Canada two weeks, and she had not a line from him. Of course he had forgotten. If there was ever anything to forget. A hand-clasp. A kiss. A look a promise asked under the influence of passing emotion. It was all absurd. She had been a silly, romantic, inexperienced goose. Well, she would be wiser in the future. Very wise, and very discreet, and very contemptuous of men and their ways. I suppose I'd better go with Una and take up household science, too, she thought as she stood by her window and looked down through a delicate emerald tangle of young vines on Rainbow Valley, lying in a wonderful lilac light of sunset. There did not seem anything very attractive just then about household science, but with a whole new world waiting to be built, a girl must do something. The doorbell rang. Rilla returned reluctantly stairwards. She must answer it. There was no one else in the house. But she hated the idea of callers just then. She went downstairs slowly and opened the front door. A man in khaki was standing on the steps. A tall fellow with dark eyes and hair, and a narrow white scar running across his brown cheek. Rilla stared at him foolishly for a moment. Who was it? She ought to know him. There was certainly something very familiar about him. Rilla, my Rilla, he said. Ken! gasped Rilla. Of course it was Ken. But he looked so much older. He was so much changed. That scar, the lines about his eyes and lips. Her thoughts went whirling helplessly. Ken took the uncertain hand she held out and looked at her. The slim Rilla of four years ago had rounded out into symmetry. He had left a schoolgirl, and he found a woman, a woman with wonderful eyes and a dented lip and rose-bloomed cheek, a woman altogether beautiful and desirable, the woman of his dreams. Is it Rilla my Rilla? He asked, meaningly. Emotion shook Rilla from head to foot. Joy, happiness, sorrow, fear, every passion that had wrung her heart in those four long years seemed to surge up in her soul for a moment, as the deeps of being were stirred. She had tried to speak, at first voice would not come. Then, yes, said Rilla. End of chapter 35 End of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery